thanks for joining us. Did you miss us? For another episode of the Tea and Trails podcast, thanks to Outdoor Active, Vela Forte, Silver, Active Root, the Centurion Running Store, Protein Rebel, Sportshoes.com, and our new Patreon partner, Big Bubble Hats for supporting the show and our community. For the price of a cuppa, you can unlock some great perks that will help take the sting out of what can be an expensive sport. Oh, last but not least, thanks to all our Patreons. Thank you so much. They dig deep every month and literally keep the lights hot, the mics on, and the fridge with a few snacks in. Go <laughs> over to Patreon and check out all the amazing deals. Also, pop over to Summit Crazy, which I did this week. If you'd like some awesome tea and trails merch, a little parcel is... Oh, uh... my God. Gary is showing off. Uh, <laughs> we recorded a um, Brew with the Coaches uh, last week and Gary wore his hoodie and we all the ladies went crazy for it. <laughs> so we have all purchased a burnt orange hoodie. Yeah, there's a rush on orange hoodie purchases. I, you are hot, Gary. There's no denying that. We yeah. always know those chiseled cheekbones have got, uh, <laughs> should be a model. But I think the orange looks good. I got called out actually by my brother-in-law because all of the, on the summit, crazy website it's all black and white so you might actually think that oh no they only do black and white merch and he was like gary you're a sunland fan why isn't there any red and white That's hilarious. <laughs> so he bought a red and white t-shirt <laughs> which i uh, thought was quite sweet yeah, i haven't good. i haven't ordered anything for the kids though they i know they would literally pull my arm off for a hoodie but i'm like am i that mum that puts your kid in your podcast <laughs> merch i'm am i i think i might be i'm not sure i'm thinking about it it's them all dripping in in merch. <laughs> <laughs> Only when they need them, though. Don't just buy them for the sake of it. You make a good point, actually, about the Patreons. Now that we've got the one, two, three brew with the coaches, Patreon in action, they helped us purchase the microphones for our coaches. So, yeah, big, big thanks to all our Patreons who dig deep every month because, yeah, that is how it works. Did feel a bit strange taking a break, but it was nice. But it's always lovely to be back behind the mics. Yeah, Brew with the Coaches is back and we have another instalment of Tales from the Trails. And it was great to have a catch up with Lizzie Faithful Davies. Also, thanks very much to Silver Support in the podcast for the month of April. Head over to www.silversweden.uk and check them out. Two weeks to catch up on Eddie. This is going to take some editing. (laughs) Some of it is not podcast. I always say I'm not going to say this on the podcast. I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to share that. And then I overshare and I tell too much. Oh, so I was due a recovery week. Like to have a recovery week. Try and plan it around the kids' holidays so that mainly. Often I don't really feel like I need a recovery week. Uh, maybe I'm a bit slack in my training, so I'm like, I think I carry on. But it helps me mentally cope with the fact when I can't get out training when I've got the kids and it drives me a little bit mad. Then I'm like, no, it's recovery week. Take it easy. So we had the last ski weekend. The kids dressed up as minions. Minions? Am I saying that in yeah. a French word? Minion. That- Min- yeah. Minion. 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 <laughs> and uh, they uh, skied around in this crazy ski race where people make like, oh, I, I need to put it on Instagram actually. People make like l- like life size boats and on skis, and then they get inside them and they have like and they dress up as like um uh what would you call what are they called the people that rescue people in boats life savers. <laughs> Like RNLI, Coast Guards. French R&L, Coast Guards. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that was that was my favorite one. I'm gonna put it on Instagram. And they had flares and smoke, and they do this like proper ski beast, and they have music cool. that goes anyway. The kids did that as an end of ski season thing, and they were minions. Slight they were slightly less exciting, but they loved that. We <laughs> had amazing snow. So we went up for like we skied one piece the whole winter as a family because they're always skiing, they're always ski training. So I was like, but I felt there was loads and loads of snow, loads and loads of powder, which makes skiing a little bit harder work. And I felt, ter- I couldn't breathe. Is it, is that 2,500 meters, 2,200 meters? So often I do get really out of breath when I'm skiing powder, especially when I'm skiing powder because I'm so terrible at it. Like, <laughs> forgot to breathe again. It's a bit like running 100 meters and you forget to breathe. Anyway, is felt- it so much harder than if, if you're on, because I've never... Yes. So when you're on the piece, you can just slide down. I don't even really... 
cruisy. It's a bit like running down a road compared to running like a technical trail on, and it's much harder on your legs. Fortunately, because Bryn is now in heavy training, his legs are really, normally his, he's like miles ahead of me down the powder. And he's like, oh my God, my legs. I was like, yes, at last you can <laughs> feel what I feel. Anyway, I did not feel well at all. And then the kids had, one of the kids had done a ski race. We had to wait for the prize giving. And I was standing there thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Came home, went straight to bed. And then that was the week. That was our, that was our week off. I had the kids and I had such a, uh, I kept COVID testing because I was like, this can't be right. I feel so ill. Bryn was away, of course. So I had the kids all by myself and I had the dog. So I had to keep like, I'd run up the track and I'd have to just stop and be like, oh, oh my goodness. God, it was disgusting. Only the week before I'd said, I don't understand how people get colds and then they can't train. I mean, I trained through anything. <laughs> Ow, baby Jesus, <laughs> struck me down with the world's ass girl. Anyway, it all coincided with recovery week, but I felt like I couldn't really enjoy my recovery week because I was just felt so ill all the time and the snot. Anyway, it did take me almost a week to feel better. So I didn't do very much running, like probably the least running I've done since the week after the spine. I literally did like little 20 minutes only because I had the dogs. Anyway, over that. So recovery week was yeah it was recovery but now I feel like I'm having another recovery week because I've now finally feel better but I still feel a little bit my chest feels a little bit I'm gonna stop whining about that so within that recovery week I also had a trip to England this is the first time since we moved here that I have gone on a social trip I went to an airport I walked around I didn't have any gels I didn't have any powders <laughs> did take my running kit offs but um I really chuckled as I got off the plane to come back and there's steps in Geneva like three or four steps it's a long walk anyone that's ever landed in Geneva airport to get out it probably takes about 20 minutes you go like one end of the airport to the other end of the airport coming back from a race coming back from the spine that it's about three hours because I kept trying to sit down. So I really chuckled when I landed on Sunday night and I was like, over to everybody, skipped down the steps. I was like, this is how normal people travel, sat on the plane and didn't need to, uh, didn't need to ask the person to crawl over the person to get and go and lie in the aisle. Anyway, so I, yeah, I went back to England for a pleasure weekend, a hen weekend of my bestest friend. Friends I've not seen all together for 12, 15 years. Like just, oh, wow. it's just, yeah, like eight, nine of us um, who we all spent the sort of, well, three or four of them are school friends. And then other people have slowly been, I forced myself into it. When I was, um, I met my best friend when we were PE teacher training. So 21 so 24 years ago and we've been through life together and so oh you have such it was such a weekend of let's just say the whole weekend only seven pictures were taken by everybody in oh, the I love it. it was I love that it. good that the talking oh my can you imagine the talking of all these women the the laughing i peed my pants so many times laughing so much uh mainly also about just the reminiscing of all the stuff we used to do in our 20s and the terrible people then telling stories that you don't remember oh. i'm going yes eddie you did that do you remember and then you woke up there and you did that because i was quite i wasn't wild but i I used to enjoy a party, Gary. I used to enjoy a party. Oh, it was just wholesome. And it was, I found it quite hard to sort of switch off because, you know, I might be on the go quite a bit. And Bryn was like, you must go and you must go and enjoy it. And so I did find that I've not been any, like, we went to a spa. I wouldn't even know what to do. I've never been to a spa. No, yeah, we... I've never been to a spa. I kept that quite quiet because you don't want to be the person going. <laughs> and I don't know. Um, but so I focused on the chat, the good time, the love. It was such a fun, such a fun weekend. But two nights in a row, not in bed before 2 a.m. Oh, my goodness. Oh, and I really tried to, I was like, I'm not going to, I'm not a heavy drinker. I never drink. I'll drink at a, you know, if we go to a wedding, I'll have a couple of glasses, but I don't drink very much anymore. So the first night I had like a couple of glasses. I'd only take Seddy a couple of glasses to become the life and soul party. And then about 1am people suggested playing beer pong. And Ooh, okay. <laughs> I captained the team and unfortunately the captain took some heavy hits and ended up having to go to bed after that game. Uh, it's really hard. I was not very good at it. I lost many, many rounds and it became... I don't like drinking games. So it was a great... And do you know where we were? We, I went on a little jog on Sunday morning to the Beckham's place. 
Oh wow. yeah, I know. I rang the kids from there and went, "Do you know whose house this is?" Couldn't really see it, but um, that is how. Yeah, that's how posh my friends are. That's the sort of crowd we hang out yeah. with. That sort of... Anyway, it was so fun. But yeah, I had two late nights to two a.m. and then I booked quite a late flight on the Sunday night to come back because I didn't want to be that person that left at seven a.m. So my flight wasn't till seven p.m. and it was delayed. I'm a little bit brindle laugh because I'm actually a lot. I'm quite nervous flyer i don't know why i get a bit anxious about the whole procedure i'm not i'm not a fan i'm not i'm i get a bit of a sweaty part once we're in the air i'm Mm. i'm fine i'm fine but i don't know why i get all that i just need to get in that seat anyway then the captain came on he's like sorry due to bad weather we've been delayed this bad weather in heathrow bad weather in geneva and i was like oh my god bye britain am i gonna survive it um (laughs) and then we sat in the plane for 90 minutes because we couldn't take off when it rained it was really, really heavy rain. And they didn't turn the air conditioning. I was getting hot. I'm thinking, just take off. Just let's just get this this over. Get in the air. And I had a movie downloaded to watch because I help I find that helps to uh just, you know, take the mind off the bat. But I couldn't start to watch it because I thought if I watch it, I'm then gonna be in the air and will definitely yeah. crash if I'm not watching the film. <laughs> um and I got hot and hotter. So they brought round water. So I drank like three of these little bottles of water and then oh, we, we took off and it was quite bumpy, but it was all it was wasn't it? I've been in much worse. And um, but they didn't turn normally, you know, they turn the seatbelt sign off after about 10 minutes once you sort of up he didn't turn it off till we were nearly over paris and i was i was literally i was in my seat going i'm gonna wet my pants oh my god i'm gonna wet my pants i was like (laughs) if i get up to go to the loo surely that's not going to cause anyone to die or myself if i you know i prefer to die in the loo if it is heavy turbulence because i am actually gonna wet my seat (laughs) and the minute they turned off the seatbelt sign i like i was at a window seat and i like dove over the other two people going i'm so sorry she she doesn't leave me (laughs) I bet it was just a mass scramble, though, was it? Oh my the God, I was so desperate. <laughs> that meant we didn't land till really late in Geneva. And then I had to drive the 90 minutes back home and I didn't get home till 2 a.m. And then I had to get up at 6 to get Goodness. the kids to school. <gasps> Ooh, I had to heavy snack all the drive home, Gary. It wasn't yeah. good. Anyway, um, that was it. was fun. I felt revived. I felt so, my heart felt full again, having been with such lovely, lovely people. And do you want to know something else about these lovely people? But they're all sporty. PE yeah. teachers, a lot of netballers, obs being friends with Eddie. Do you know what they listen to? Oh, let me guess. Let me guess. Tea and Drills podcast. <laughs> Number one podcast. Definitely. And they were all like, so what's Gary like? So like he's like they're like how did you meet Gary and uh, like wh- like what's that friendship like I was like this is stuff I can't this is stuff I can't share this is stuff I can't share love it <laughs> so not a great deal of running gossip but a little bit of real life gossip oh my gosh I thought they were also I'll stop twitching on about this in a minute they were also like talking about their real lives when I was like. God, they, every like next weekend they all live quite close to each other, and they're like, so next weekend we're doing going to this party and doing this. And I was like, this is like a once a year. Next, I couldn't do something again. Next, oh my gosh, I couldn't do that. <laughs> oh my goodness, I couldn't do that. But I was like, this is, I guess, if you're not always running and training for stuff, yeah. you do have it. And then I was like, do I need? Should I get a bit more of a life? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I feel alive, Eddie. When I was. I'm sliding down witless pike on my bum. I felt alive. <laughs> yes, because there was a lot of questions, like about, especially about like the spine race of like, well, why would you do that? Yeah. Why would you do that? And that's a hard question. I I sort of have given up now trying to explain to people that don't want to partake in such amazing glamorous activities. Like it's hard to explain it. But yeah, I did have a moment when I thought, should I should I perhaps retire and. Do be more sociable, but I'm over that now. Right, let's talk real. You've done some real running, Gary. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I did. I actually so oh my goodness, it feels like such a long time ago. They've got this thing called the Let's Run Round, which is part of the Let's Run shop. I think they designed the route. It's about 30 miles, Yorkshire Mills, Rosby Topping, the three sisters, mm. below the crossings, very nice terrain, quite runnable, quite friendly trails compared to teenager with altitude. <laughs> The, the, the following week but yeah great day I think 30 miles I can't remember what the elevation was it wasn't too did spectacular. you do it with mates I went with a friend um, Aaron that day and it was great so yeah me and Aaron run quite a lot actually the week before we did a big bomb gra- Bob Graham round recce and then this week was the let's run round but I wanted to go and I wanted a bit of retail therapy and I timed it rotten because the shop was shut on a Sunday so 
<laughs> what a Dave. Uh, but yeah, great day. And what is good, but Shelly Gordon, who owns the Let's Run uh, shop in Great she is going to be a future guest of the show. So I can't wait for that. So if you have fancy a nice day out in the moors, I would definitely go out and check out Let's Run Run. What is it? I haven't, I haven't got it yet, but if you verify your GPX data, get a nice little sew on badge. So I'm like, <gasps> oh, I'm so into these sew on badges. Yeah, yeah. Love I've like got one. Oh, did you know I've got one for the spine and I need to think about where to sew Ooh. it? Deb's had a really nice rucksack that she had and she'd sewn them onto her rucksack. Where do you sew it? Or do you sew it? Maybe a towel. Do you remember that when you got swim badges and you sewed them onto your towel? Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> do that, yeah. Or you used to put them on your speedos. I used to put my little 25 metres badge and my 50 metres badge on my, yeah. on my undies. <laughs> Still do that. Still do that. But then we had a race. So yesterday, no, sorry, Saturday, we had a race, which was a teenage with altitude, which I've mentioned a few times, I think, on the podcast. I was so nervous. Oh, why? I don't know. I'd never done it. And the and the stats, the numbers were like, wow. Yeah, mind-boggling. Yeah. Yeah, five to five to one ratio. So that is big, big vert per mile. Um, so yeah, I gave myself a little mini tape, but I didn't go to the gym at all last week. Give myself a break. I did loads of mobility work, stretching and stuff like that. I only had one workout and then it was just strides and lots of easy running, but it was a blast. Um, really, really tough climbs and the descents were just insane. There was one descent. I can't remember where it was. Where it was. I couldn't physically see the bottom at one point. As you went over the top, it was like, wow, how steep is this? But then it opened out and it was fine. And it was just, you know, I slipped over and then shot past about three people as I skidded past them <laughs> on my bum. I thought, well, this is, this is the way it was. It was awesome. It was awesome. 100% I will do it again. I, came, I was just buzzing when I came away because I was so anxious about it. And I just, the perfect day. I, we, the, the plan was, you know, Neil and I stayed together for it because we've got the old county tops coming up in a few weeks now. We thought we'd do it all county tops pace. There's no way we'd apply that effort to all county tops because I think we we're both pretty pooped after four hours of running. So all, all county tops is going to be it. I was running. So how yeah, much? Yeah. How much running did you actually? How many steps oh, of running did you do in that? God, I think maybe maybe about a mile. All in all, <laughs> two miles of running. Maybe maybe if that. You know, you came up Grassmower, which was the highest point, and there was a bit of running there, and then from Hindscar to Dale Head, bit of running, and then over Cat Bells. We got lost going to Cat Bells. I say lost. We lost probably about three or four minutes in the fog. I've been up in a Capel. Capel's just like a just a basically a very simple path. And we were just it just went off the line. It was like, where's this path? Where's this path? We thought we were so worried not to go too far left. We ended up going too far right. And anyway, we got a bit lost. Um, but that added to the jeopardy because I had no real aspirations for the run, but we just thought it'd be nice if we could get under four hours. And I thought, I was doing the maths in my head, I thought, well, there's no way we're going to be under four hours. That's for, for, for my ability. But anyway, with this um, three or four minutes kind of wandering around in the in the clag, we finished the race in, I think it was 3.59 and 40 seconds. Ooh. So it was, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was looking at my watch and that last year, I think I was split for the last half a mile. We were doing like six and a half minute mile. And so Oof. pretty, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Did, uh, did Tom Evans turn up? He didn't turn up, no. But Jack Scott was there. And um, um. Finley Wild too. There's, there's two races that day. There's the Memorial Race, which is a shorter uh, version but it's pretty similar you join they don't do the first chunk they don't go up to Causey Pike and outside and Grassmoor but yeah it was what great would you, what a... would you say about that race to like people where would they fit it in their calendar like if you if you're comfortable on that terrain would you say it would be quite good sort of Lakeland not that it's specific to Lakeland but getting that sort of climbing in your legs that when then you go back to Lakeland trails you're like this is relatively this is Whoa. smooth riding would that work <laughs> um uh, well, where because there's so little the running that, that's my only kind of reservation for recommending it as a Lakeland bit of training because there, there just wasn't that much running at all. If you've got aspirations for a Bob Graham round, okay, then yeah, go for it. Dragon's back. Um, Excellent. Well, this is the thing. This is the Snowdonia, from what I've heard of that course. Excellent. Well, yeah, the day, day one Dragon's back race, I think it is pretty perfect. Um, maybe not the exposure, like you get over Crib Gok and stuff like that, obviously, but the elevation per mile. Is it about, uh, oh, my goodness me, 3,000 metres the first day on Dragon's Back? Yeah, it's about that, isn't it? And 30-odd miles. So this this ratio is more aggressive than day one on Dragon's Back race. But it was just wild. If you've got the 
I think you have to have done a Class AFL race in the past. I'm okay. not too sure. But how does anybody ever do a Class AFL race if they have to do a Class <laughs> AFL race to get into the race? I need to, <laughs> I'm not too sure. Yeah, you wouldn't want to go, what I'm like, you wouldn't want to go and do this if you're not relatively comfortable on quite steep terrain. Yeah. Yeah, is that yeah. right? You've got, you, you've got to be comfortable. The, the descent. Go and do some probably, Bob Graham sections and get used to going downhill. And what I would say is, I had my Peregrines with the soft ground shoes, and they had like seven and a half, eight mil lugs. Big Nail lugs. had mud claws. Yeah, hundred percent. Big, big jugs, you big lugs. Some... You want for yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, hundred percent. I do it again. And why I am a bit seduced. Um, Oh, because obviously jokes. next year I'm yeah, big jokes. <laughs> I'm more of a bum, bum man. Um, is oh, oh, you've knocked me off track now. I'm <laughs> thinking about jokes and bums. Uh, jokes yes, I'm 50. 50. <laughs> I'm going to be okay. 50 next oh, year. And I was, over it. Yeah, Gary, still got no, it. That but I was looking at the 50 year old, uh, top three in the 50 year old category. And maybe if I tread that, which I'm going to contradict this later on the show because I've Entered. I know. Don't say. Don't say. Just. Oh, you. Well, so bad. <laughs> it was the next thing I'm going to talk about. So yeah, if I tread that as my ear race, maybe I could come away with a little podium yeah. V50 finish. So. And do you think it is the sort of race you did it with Neil, big time fan? Yeah. It it sounds like sort of race because it's not it's not in intensity as in you're running you're running you're climbing and you can do that with a pal. I can imagine it's sort of thing that is more fun to do together, especially when there's tricky descending and you can sort of laugh and yeah. take it in turns to lead. <laughs> well, it's step. funny although we were very aware that we were with each other and we stay together quite a lot. Now it's it's a great little com- companionship that we've got. We didn't talk much. No, <laughs> there wasn't from the off. Because you ran straight up Causey Pike. Oh, not ran, but you no, ran straight no, up no Pike. talking on the up. Though we yeah. have that general rule around here too. The up is we're like we'll catch up at the top. <laughs> if you've got a mate, yeah, if you've got a mate that's roughly similar abilities, and you make a pack to stay together, then yeah, go for it, stay together. I think yeah, because there's a big, there's a big adventure. Chris, one of the our friends, he he went shooting off, and then he went in a bog and lost his shoe. And as he ran past him, he had some colourful language. <laughs> Did he find the shoe? He did, yeah, and he uh, he carried on. I think he finished about ten minutes behind us in the end. Um, but yeah, awesome, awesome day. Absolutely loved it. I would definitely go back next year. It's London Marathon weekend, though. That's the problem. So if anyone is aspiring, like me, like to kind of straddle both worlds, it's such like, similar, yeah. such similar races. <laughs> But yeah, from a, an event's point of view, I just thought it was perfect. Four hours, we were off of just under four hours, so a good day's graft. Yeah, got a bit of doms afterwards. I just felt <gasps> nourished. Everything, you know, the community, it wasn't enormous. The route, we got lucky with the weather, although it was cloudy, there weren't spe- spectacular views, but we could. the forecast was like rain, heavy rain, it wasn't none of that. So Sometimes if you're doing that. tricky descending, you don't want to really see what's around you as well. It's kind of just <laughs> focus on the line. I like the way you felt nourished nourished from being outside that wholesome air and I felt nourished from drinking yeah. the and eating my body weight and <laughs> kettle chips <laughs> but yeah anybody who fancies it uh definitely check it out I think it's Cumberland fell runners and yeah if you've got the relevant experience that you know you can't have GPX files so people want to um download the route onto their watch that is not allowed that's frowned upon I think fell running rules I am not you know I can use a compass I can use a map but luckily, where I was in the field, I didn't need to because there was always, apart from Capels, which, which I can't <laughs> believe I got lost there. Um, but yeah, there was always people ahead of us and behind us. So it, the nav wasn't really a problem. A bit of podcast business. We've got a new Patreon to you. So thanks so much to Ultra Trails, Dale's Runner, and the Green and Miles Runner for joining our organizer to it over on Patreon. Basically, I thought... I don't know <clears throat> anything about this, by the way, guys. This is... Gary loves to go <laughs> off on his own little projects and set it up. And then he'll say, what do you think about this? And I'll say, oh, that's a great idea. And then within 20 seconds, it's live. Don't and I'm like, you, you'd you planned all this. You you could not... You cannot wait. But it's a great idea. So explain to me and everybody what's going on here. Yeah, basically, if you are if you organize events, it could, it could be a race um, series. You may be even do training camps or something like that and i don't know you just want to shine a bit of light on it or you may be struggling to sell out you can then join this patreon tier and that allows you to share your bits and bobs with our community i initially set it up to be 10 members i thought i'd rein it in to be 
to five members. I just didn't want the Facebook group, especially, I suppose, to become kind of diluted with lots and lots of races being advertised over there. So yeah, three have already been taken. So if you fancy taking up another one of those slots, then yeah, pop over to Patreon. So what do they get in return for joining? They can post on the Facebook group about their races. Yeah, po- post on the Facebook group. Um, we'll put links to their uh, website within the show notes. And also if they want to come on the podcast, um, give us some got a good story to share. Yeah, yeah, get on there. Give us some data and we'll get you on the podcast. Um, you might think like, oh, that's so bad, Eddie and Gary. Why can't everybody just share everything on the Facebook group? One, as Gary said, then the Facebook group just becomes just so much stuff but also i think then you know if stuff goes on the facebook group gary or i or both of us have vetted it i've got a personal investment in it um it's good stuff these people and they also support the podcast so anybody that supports the podcast they're good people um so it's sort of like a round of i love the circle of friendship that goes on there as well also of course if somebody said you know I'm doing this for chat. You know, we're we're not closing the doors. We're just saying this yeah. is another, this is another little area we're looking at. So thank you, Ultra Trails, Dale's Runner, and Greener Miles. And yeah, I did allude to. Oh, I didn't allude to. It, I actually just blurted you told it right us, out. Gary, let's not pretend. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> I've entered a marathon. Yeah, I. You had FOMO, FOMO beyond FOMO. Inspiration. Oh, I'm not too sure <laughs> what it was, but I was. Um, I enjoyed the London Marathon coverage so much. I just thought, yeah, I want another slice of that. I have stepped off the good for age because of the uh, time frame the last time I did a, a road marathon so I can't qualify yet so I have York obviously end of the year which is a right off really just after Lake 100 and Dragon's Back race don't what be I that person this... Gary don't be that person on this just, just out for an easy five just out for an easy five three days post uh, thousand miler <laughs> feel fine feel fine 100%, 100% if I'm on that start line at York I'll go off at whatever pace I think Four I need to do. Pace. But then, yeah, I thought as a as a kind of little bit of an insurance policy, okay. enter Manchester what Marathon. What is your good for age bracket? Well, it's quite generous now, 315. So Okay. I think you're in 315 shape. To me, 315 shape is, that's the sort of shape, everyday shape I like to be in. I like to feel I could run a 315 marathon on a comfortable day. Well, I'm worried that... You're looking just at me not... like, Eddie, <laughs> you are mad. <laughs> well, I think I could. You know, was it Valencia? I did three hours and two seconds. And then um, I think it's just London that year too. I did 2.59 something. So, and I'm not like I've just stopped running. I have run. I'm just not those long Sunday flat runs. And some of it's at specific. I know, I know. <laughs> so I think the fitness is there. Maybe the long-term leg speed uh, for a marathon is, isn't is there. But what again, because I've been super greedy, Eddie, I looked at this teenager's attitude thinking, oh yeah, I'd like to get a top three in the V50 possibly. if I, I'd have to really rinse myself. Manchester Marathon is the week before teenager with altitude. Why do we even have to have this discussion? <laughs> it's exhausting, Gary. It's like I'm just greedy. <laughs> you know what it is? I I just love I just love running. And the marathon above anything, I you know, I mentioned, I think in a Facebook post that teenage with altitude is mile per mile, the toughest route I've ever done. The marathon is just insane and it is it's so it's hard. It's insane. It's so hard. I, c- I can't I can't face it, Gary. <laughs> I just can't face mile four blowing out my ass knowing I've got to do another twenty two. <laughs> yeah. I, I just like, oh, it's just holding that pace is so hard. It's just so much nicer right. to run a hundred miles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have a walk now. Have a little walk for five minutes. <laughs> and you and stop and talk to people and yeah. spend ages climbing the style and opening the gate <laughs> and have, a, have a wee and it won't having a wee and it won't affect like marathon you can't yeah. have a wee you can't stop for a wee or it's all out Goodness the window yeah, yeah, my yeah. bladder Especially... gary i can't i need four wees <laughs> <laughs> But when it goes well, you know this, when it goes well, it's just like magic. It's like, wow, I'm on the edge, but I'm in control. And I just fancy a a slice of that. I just fancy a slice of that. Let's, we're not going to talk about it now, but yeah, we'll have to break this cake up and stop you being so greedy. But let's just get through the Lakeland Dragon's Back combination because I just want to see what comes out the other side of that. I'm intrigued. (laughs) (laughs) But the biggest thing that's happened in the Thwaites household since we last had a chat is my son has turned 50. Dean, I can't 15. believe he's finally legally allowed to watch all the stuff he's already watching. On he Netflix can watch Bodyguard, and... Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, yeah. 
Independence Day, you know, all the classics yeah. that all I... All the Marvel. They're, I'm pretty sure Marvel's all 15. Which, oh, maybe it's 12. Maybe it's 12. Great. We went it's Ike not... Axe Throne. I've never done... Have you ever Where done that did that Throne? idea come from? Could have been Lisa or George. I'm not too sure which one it was. And I was really... I thought, yeah, this is right up my street, Axe Throne. But I've done miniature golf with the kids in the past and stuff like that. And when it's not going well for either of them, the what should be a fun time descends into aggressive chaos with about 10 minutes. Like the beer really pop. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> so I thought, oh, I'm going to see if they can't, if they're not getting these axes in the, in the target, it's not going to be much fun. So I was really stressed out about how it was going to pan out. But luckily, Esme struggled. I'm not going to gloss it up. She did struggle. <laughs> but George, who it was his dear, he nailed it. He loved it. He had the the like uh, quite, they quite, quite heavy. The, the guy Not did a great me, job because I go to the gym, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> he came, he came out. He had all these like the standard axes, different weights. He explained all that. But then he kept coming out every five minutes with like a more impressive a lighter weapon. one for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like. <laughs> but he kept coming out. He said, "Okay, now you've done that. He's the knives. He's the the Death Stars." Then he had like a like a climbing ice pick, and you just would have thought that would have been so hard to to throw. But if you I'm going to buy one as a no, no, <laughs> no, no, as a as if I'm going to do a race, a bit of kind of, but it's there security because wow, if you've got an intruder, no, no you can't do. <laughs> I got it in the ball every time I hit the target with the okay, ice. Okay, so now I'm going to buy one so that if anyone comes into my house, I know I can really deal with them with my. Well, I couldn't axe. get the knives in, so there's no point in me chucking a knife at someone. It just <laughs> bounces. You've off. been watching too much Night Agent. <laughs> this is the problem. Yeah, I mean, I've started watching Night Agent. Yeah, but it was, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. I never, I didn't even know it was a thing until about two weeks no. ago when Lisa. Started. No, nor does any of us listening. But now we're like. I want to ask more questions like the arm angle, the oh, weight. Just literally, like... you, we did the double, double Ooh, tomahawk. Double. We had tomahawk. Oh my goodness me! I really, really enjoyed it. And they sold alcohol, which I thought was like, oh, I'm not too sure. Alcohol and axes. <laughs> it wasn't such a good combination. But yeah, luckily, no disasters. Yeah, really, really good. And now it's tonight, so it's Tuesday. We've got a family takeaway meal to carry on. These celebrations these days, Eddie, they're going, it's like, oh, wait. Know. <laughs> I know, these kids these days, and we have quite a uh, mesh of birthdays. They're all quite similar. They come month after month after month. It's quite expensive. It uh, but I do love a birthday. I think it's important to celebrate your birthday. No one Waffles else for breakfast too. Love a birthday <gasps> breakfast. Oh, birthday birthday. breakfast. God, I'm coming to your house next breakfast. Uh, next birthday. I don't want to do the axe throwing though. And I'm a bit nervous about coming to your house now in case I arrive late because my flight's delayed and then you get the ice axe out and it all ends <laughs> horribly. Axe, and... Yeah, <laughs> see it by the shoe rack. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, um... top tip for security. Ice, <laughs> no, ice <pick>. you... <laughs> now this is a professional format now it started a bit rough and ready it was a bit loosey-goosey we were all in it and now this i have to say that there is some advice here which people would pay good money for coming out N out none of our mouths trish russell but <laughs> dr rebecca cam had joined the team and she did so well because we had her to initiation up our game, didn't we we upped our game. I felt we upped our game, but also every time we lowered or digressed, she brought us back. <laughs> she was a very good, she was calm. She was cool. She didn't, she didn't speak unless we asked her. And then when we asked her the words of wisdom that came out and we were all listening going, yes. So big thanks. Big thanks to our, all our Patreons again. Your support allowed us to, as we mentioned earlier, send mics to the coaches. And also we've been able to thank them by getting them all a hoodie to say thank you because they give up a lot. It takes quite a long time to record Brew with the Coaches. Um, I think they enjoy it. I think they do. I think <laughs> so, yeah. I think so. <laughs> we what probably we... giggled for about half an hour, then we do a bit. We of... did. A, there was a lot of laughing. Uh, uh, so what's this week, Gary? We have got a question from Welsh Bird, and she would like some help regarding a preparation race ahead of her ear race. I was taking notes for this because we've alluded to, I like to put a preparation <laughs> race in before an ear race. So yeah, hopefully this helps not just Welsh Bird, but anybody who's got a big race coming up.
This week's brew with the coach's question comes from Welsh Bird. Now, she is taping for an ultra, uh, 130 kilometres with almost 10,000 metres of elevation. That's 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 a pretty big deal. <laughs> is it sensible to put in a preparation race three weeks before the race, or is it too close? The preparation race is over two days. Each day has a marathon distance with 2,500 metres of climbing. I entered thinking it would be a perfect last weekend of long runs, but do you think it's a teeny bit close to the actual race. I generally run about 80 to 100k a week in the mountains, so get plenty of elevation, and I think I recover pretty quickly. She's just having a little wobble about the time between the two events. This sounds like my Lakeland 100 last long run before Dragon's back race. So, yeah, I'm really keen. <laughs> you can take notes, Gary. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. What, what do you reckon, yeah. Russell? <laughs> I Russell was, can't talk. He did yeah. the pa Paddy just before DBR. Yeah, I did. <laughs> that was it. I did um, Paddy Buckley two weeks before Dragon's Back Race. Um, so I know where you're coming from, Welsh birds, but there were a few things that I would I would um, suggest you have a think about. One is the fact that you're asking this question. It's probably a little bit of a, a tell. You, the last thing you want to be doing is going into this weekend of running. With those doubts in your mind, it's going to be more likely that you're you know, you're going to carry those into the race and not fully enjoy the experience. So that's something I would already be considering. Am I going to be able to go out and and give this the uh, effort that it deserves? And if not, then what could you do about that? And one option would maybe be drop one day. I don't know how logistically likely that is and that you can do that maybe drop one day or maybe think about really keeping a lid on the intensity and the effort. And I know it's one thing saying and another thing doing, and once you're in race mode, but you really need to think about what you want now and what you want most, um, which is the A goal here. And if this is not the A goal, you really got to ask that question. Like, is this going to detract at all from the A goal? It's great that you're doing 80, kilometers a week. How many years have you been doing that? I've been running 160 to 200 kilometers a week for 10 years. So that's quite a lot of mileage that I had to sit back on. And I knew that I could get the paddy, which was 60 kilometers, two weeks later, come and do Dragon's Back, which none of those days were actually as long. They were more like, um, they were shorter days, but um, drawn out over six. So uh, yeah, they would be the things I'd think about. Make sure you're going to enjoy both and set yourself to, to enjoy both. And if you're not going to enjoy this, what sounds like a B race, skip it, do it one day, or just put something in place that you, you know, run with a friend who's a bit slower than you, just take down the intensity so that you can really focus on your A goal. I would say yes, if you can handle the load and um, it's within your ability to do it if, if you're going to uh, use, not race it basically. If you're, if you, so I would say, do do it if you're not going to race it and you're going to stay within your ability to use it as getting miles, elevation, et cetera, uh, almost as a, as a peak week. And then you can use that, your taper off the back of that. Um, so yes, if you're going to chill your beans, no, if you're going to race it. I think that's too, I think that's too close to the mark. Uh, and if I was coaching you, I would say, you, you, you know, your, your risk of injury, it's a B race. It's not your A race, uh, your risk of injury and racing that hard, you know, that, that risk outweighs the benefits of, of you, of you doing it. So I would say, yes, if you're gonna, yes, if you're going to chill your beans, no, if you're going to race it hard and only you as an individual will know whether or not you'll be able to hold back on the day. It's very hard to be disciplined. I totally agree with Trish on this one. If you can hold back, it's in the perfect position to test everything, your kit, your nutrition, and your pacing. Yeah. Because if you run that at your 130K or 10,000 meters of elevation, if you're able to let everybody in the field run away from you and run it at your race pace, you will be three weeks out. Most of us will be putting in our biggest volume. It might be that you have to taper a little bit earlier than you would because you need to recover from that. But I always think, there's, you know, you know, three weeks out from race, actually the training is done, isn't it? The fitness is there. Um, so I don't think you're going to lose 
lose anything as long as you can reinforce to yourself and also really focus on your fueling. And if anything goes wrong, you have to give yourself the caveat. If you feel any twinges, if the nutrition isn't going well, you have to stop because you could do damage, which you won't be able to recover from. So if all the boxes align, <laughs> we're so jammy on me. If everything works, it'll be perfect. If it doesn't, it'll be a disaster. Good luck. <laughs> Uh, Rebecca, what do you think from like a recovery point of view? Can Welsh Bird in three weeks, can she pull it round from, let's say that's like probably about a couple of six hour days, isn't it? A couple of six mm. hour days. And then three weeks later, she's basically doing 24 hours and three weeks later. From a medical point of view, is that long enough to recover, do you reckon? I think it does come back to how much she's done similar back to backs already uh, and what's her recovery like from that. But I would certainly echo okay, what you just said about you have to assume really she's going to taper from there on in, isn't she? Um, I think it would be difficult to do any significant running after that um, and ensure you've had a, a sufficient recovery. Uh, so, yeah, it's like a, it's a big week and then an earlier taper, I, I would suggest. Yeah. You've got the doctor's thumbs up. Go do it. Let us know how it. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be amazing self-control i'm probably going to race everything that's in front of me um yeah. But yeah. <laughs> All in. i can't i can't do a training race i would put my hands up and say i'm not in it i'm not if i'm on a start line i'm going to rip your head off to beat you basically oh, go i'm going home, I'm, going home. <laughs> I'm not interested in i'm not interested in all the logistics of getting to a race for a training race and that's you know that's you know people that are i prefer to do an at-home training camp and focus and and then i know i'll be in control in a race I just know even if my was going yeah yeah this is totally comfortable I'm totally fine <laughs> snot gels I just would not I just and I wouldn't enjoy it because I'd be like mm, I can I see them. my I could yeah, I could them. Be, oh, by the way I could beat you but this is training race <laughs> by the way <laughs> but I'm relaxing I'm taking it easy I'm not working here I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not I'm not tired I'm not tired <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't put on Lake 100 training, training race. Um, yeah, you got to own it oh, for me anyway. <laughs> cool. Well, let's know how you get on. I'm fascinated. Brilliant. This week, we chat with Lizzie Faithful Davis. What a woman. Uh, I knew Liz, knew of Lizzie before The Spine because I'd seen her do The Spine before. I'd heard about, I'd seen her do. I always thought, this girl's got some gumption. I didn't really know her story or where she was from until I ran The Spine. And she popped up in my, back on episode seven, go and catch it out if you haven't listened to it yet. Uh, she pops up numerous times in my journey of The Spine. I'm going to save all that for us to talk about at the start of the podcast. But she also also has a really interesting story to tell. She is one tough lady, but also one of the kindest, loveliest women you're going to meet. So get to know with us, Lizzie Faithful Davis. Good morning, Lizzie Faithful Davis. I look a lot better than when you last saw me, don't I? <laughs> Definitely, yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm slightly less puffy from being oh. outside for so long. Oh my God, <laughs> awful. Uh, where are you? What's the view from your many windows that are around you? And have you been for a run today? I am at home this morning uh, because I thought it'd be easier to have a chat rather than sitting in work. Um, and that's in Wiltshire. I live near Marlborough on the Kennet Valley. So it's a really, really lovely place to live. I have not been for a run this morning. Uh, today is a strength and conditioning day. So that has been done already. So oh, oh, my goodness. Yeah, so we're recording in the morning. This at 9 a.m. Lizzie, of course, has already done her strength and conditioning. What did that involve? Um, I have two sessions of strength and conditioning a week. Uh, one is sort of a heavier weight session, which is later in the week. And then this session is done uh, via online with my coach and she records the training. Um, and then it's a progressive program over four weeks. And then you reset with a set of exercises and builds up over the next four weeks. So that was week three of April, just a slight reset after the Northern Traverse. But that was my um, second um, strength session after Northern Traverse. And how's the body feeling after Northern Traverse? 
surprisingly good actually yeah it's um i'm amazed i can't believe that it's it's bounced back quite quickly i had a nice easy week immediately after the northern traverse and felt felt incredible after the actual race i finished at um i think it was 7 seven thirty in the evening uh waited for nikki summers to finish and then went back to campsite and thought i was going to be really achy just sort of moving around but it was actually quite mobile uh and then started some easy running a couple of weeks afterwards um and now i'm back to my normal training program but the intensity is slightly less at the moment in terms of distance um but feeling yep yeah, surprisingly good which is amazing amazing uh and the last little bit of the question was what's the view from your window can you see the so it looks i can't see what's outside something yeah big so um the view is my garden probably you oh, can see nice. um and my patio um and you won't be able to see it from here. There's probably also a dog in the background. You might not be able to see that. Um, <laughs> yeah, probably in a beanbag and there's one at my feet. Um, and there's a little river down at the end of the garden, which is a mill stream, oh. which oh, the dogs absolutely love because they just spend time splashing around chasing ducks in there whenever whenever it's summery. What uh, what breed are the dogs? How old are they? What's their names? We want all the deets. Both black Labradors. They're mother and daughter. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Bramble's at my feet. She's 11 now. Uh, and she's still amazing. She's retired herself from running. She says she doesn't want to run anymore. Um, <laughs> but she'll still happily go out for long hikes. We were doing eight, nine miles um, uh, over uh, leave recently up in Yorkshire in the Lake District. And she's happily trotting around. And she'll, she'll run a bit, um, but she just doesn't want to go for a long run. And Teasel is the younger one. She's six now. Um, and, yeah, she's full of beans still. Uh, she doesn't particularly like running. It's not her thing. Um, but I can, she'll love a really long day in the hills of run walk type thing rather than just flat, flat running uh, and i've got a cat in the background as well um he's he's asleep uh, as usual <laughs> he i love i love labradors they have a very set like yeah no we don't do that no no <laughs> we we don't really want to be happy to come walking but we don't want to really run oh yeah bramble used to run loads um and she, so she was my proper running buddy and then she was just like yeah i'm getting a bit old for this now yeah <laughs> Yeah, if my I ever old... see a lab coming towards me when I'm running, some dogs I'm a bit like, oh, how this how's this going to go? But always if it's a Labrador, it's like, yeah, we'll be okay. We'll be oh, okay with a Labrador. They're, lovely, yeah, aren't they? they're always so pleased to see you. And they're just like, you got snack? Do you have a snack? Because yeah. you've not been fed <laughs> for days. into somebody's pocket every time. It's like, oh. <laughs> You timed it really well uh, to finish the Northern Traverse at 7.30. That's a very sociable time to finish. It was, uh, yeah, it was lucky. And I had the most amazing sort of view coming in along the coastline um, as the sun was coming down. Uh, as you hit, you hit the coast, then you, you travel along until you get into Robin Hood's Bay. So it was yeah. a really good time, sort of a little bit of reflection, still daylight. I could enjoy the finish. When I finished the, the Winter Spine, it was one o'clock in the morning or something ridiculous. So it was just grey, miserable. You get these sort of silent clouds. Perhaps everyone goes, well, <laughs> yeah. not wanting to be too loud. Whereas actually running through Robin Hood Bay, you know, people were up and about. And yeah, um, yeah it, was a, it was a lovely, lovely time to finish. And something about finishing at the sea as well must be lovely. Yes. Yeah. yeah really, really special. And I think it was, um, it's a, it, it's, I always find the last bit of a race is quite reflective. You have a bit mm. where you got some energy and you're pushing through for the last bit and then you're just like actually i just want to appreciate this before i see people again and have to have to talk to people and communicate yeah. and being by the sea you can just look out to sea and just think a little bit and reflect and just think that's a pretty amazing journey especially having started from the sea as well that that yeah. sort of it really brings it to life that you've just just crossed the width of england i love that i love we talked about this quite a few times on the podcast that point to point especially like you see a sea to sea I just think it's wonderful. Before we talk about the Northern Traverse, though, we'll rewind a little bit. Could you share with us uh, your journey as a runner and how you got into ultra running? Yeah, I've I've always always been really sporty. I've loved sports since I was really small, and I've always loved the outdoors. All of our family holidays were in the Lake District when I was little, so we were out in the hills and playing in the rivers and that sort of stuff. So that. So I've I've just loved the outdoors, but I've never never really felt that I was much of a runner. I I ran because I had to run. Uh, um, certainly for work wise, I had to be fit enough to do to do my job. Uh, I used to do a lot of athletics uh, when I was at school, but again, that was more the field events with the bits that I was really good at. I was really good at throwing and jumping, yeah. um, and I was good enough on the track, but not. I was never 
the, the top pick to, to, to represent at any of the races, but I was always the, the also ran. If you needed somebody else to get the one point for having two people in a race, you know, yeah. I'd be the one that would randomly be doing hurdles one week and then another week <laughs> I'd be doing the 1500, another week I'd be doing the 100. Um, so I was always sort of the, the extra one, but never, never really strong. So I, I, I never felt um, that running has never been easy for me. And so it's been a bit of fight, certainly when I joined the army, you know, we've got some really incredible incredibly fit people, really strong people. So it's always a bit of a battle mentally and physically, I felt to sort of keep up and be able to sort of lead um, from a physical side. Uh, and so it was much, much later on, um, I was, uh, I did an adventurous training expedition. We did the Tour de Mont Blanc route. Uh, so we hiked it, uh, We well, fast, fast, fast packed it in essence um, with, um, some people I did know, other people I didn't know, but we went off on this trail and I got to know a guy there called Owen, who's um, a, good, a great friend of mine. Um, and as we were doing the fast packing route and we sort of got faster, got more competitive, throwing ourselves down the hills as you nice. do. Um, and he said to me, oh, you should give ultra running a go. I was like, don't be ridiculous. I can barely even run a marathon. Um, I've only ever done one marathon. Um, and he said, no, you'd be, you'd be great at it because you're strong at hiking up the hills. You're good at running on the flat and you love running downhill. Slightly uh, crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, no way. I can't, I, I can't do that. But then four of us from that e expedition, we, Owen convinced us all to sign up to do the Lakeland 50 the next year. Um, so that was my that was my first uh, ultra, which is probably, with hindsight, was a bit bit ambitious. Um, uh, but we we trained and we went off and did the Lakeland Fifty. All of us, uh, it really really hurt. It was, <laughs> but it's such a beautiful <laughs> beautiful route, and I love the Lake District. That's sort of where my heart really is. Um, and so th that amazing bit about an ultra running, you sort of crawl into the finish after your first ultra, everything hurts, you can't move. Um, and then suddenly within 24 hours, you're deciding what next. Um, and that was me hooked, completely hooked. And when I, I look see. back, I realise it's all the endurance things that I've loved doing. Mm. I've done mm. a number of long distance events, uh, like uh, long distance swimming. Um, some of the military competitions are quite long distance. Um, I love the hiking. Uh, uh, I used to row a lot at university as well. So, and then, again, it was the endurance side of that that really suited me so I, I guess ultra running was sort of is my natural strength but it took me a while to realize it and then I dabbled around in a few ultras that was 2018 I think I did my first one and then dabbled around in a few since then and I've been learning every single race I learned <laughs> to do. I get something wrong I see someone who's amazing at something I think I must try and emulate that um so I'm I'm still on a huge learning journey uh but but I love it I really really love it and it's the people I think that that for me absolutely make this a sport that you just have to be part of and whether it's fellow competitors or uh the the supporters uh and you know the the event uh, organizers they're just so so engaging and friendly and such a fantastic mix of people really interesting yeah. when you end up chatting to someone that you would never otherwise have met and then suddenly they become you know friend for life and you're best friends best yeah. friend. <laughs> it's just amazing and that that bit of it i really love and i feel i've got a network of people i now know through ultra running that that are nothing to do with work, nothing to do with home life, but just a fantastic group of people that I can phone up and say, I'm in your neck of the woods. Do you fancy meeting up for a trail run? Which is, yeah, yeah really special. Still you waiting still for that call, Gary. Still waiting for the call. She hasn't called me yet. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been to France yet. <laughs> You still go with the Lakeland 50, though. They're not all, you know, people sign up to a race and think every ultra race is like the Lakeland 50. They're might be a little bit disappointed if there's 50 people on the start line somewhere. Lakeland 50 is like, uh, I think it's a perfect event, really. Size, uh, community, and even still being intimate too. Finishing in Coniston, if it's a sunny day, it's just a <gasps> magical experience. Coming, you feel pumped. like a legend as you come around that corner and everyone's p pissed in the pub. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Could we talk about um, your role in the army? I'm really curious. A brigadier, I'm, I'm correct in saying that. Yes. What does that involve? Yeah, your role in the army. I'd love to, if you could share a so, bit about that. So my background, like when I commissioned from Sandhurst, um, I commissioned into the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. So I'm a mechanical engineer by by trade and by profession. Um, so that shaped a lot of the jobs I've done. I think I've been the I think it's 25 years. It's, it's quarter what, of a century. That's terrifying. What is, what is a mechanical engineer? Tell us. A little, is it like the tank's broken, Lizzie? We need you come in, or is that 
Is yeah, that... so in essence, the, the the basic job you do when, as as a young officer joining into the into the REMI, um, you are running workshops where we maintain the army's kit and equipment. So you've got uh, a bunch of really bright soldiers, which is is good, and it, it is good because I've heard well. other stories. Um, but they're all technically minded. They've all got a trade. So they're either a vehicle mechanic, a recovery mechanic, an electronics technician, uh, armorer, those sorts of technical trades. Uh, and therefore, whichever unit or organization you're supporting, you just fix all their kits. And it can be everything from their watch, their compasses, through to the tank, uh, the communication system. So there's a huge breadth of things that we fix depending on the role that you have at at a time um, and you so those are jobs we talk about where you're in a command role where you're responsible for soldiers and trying to uh, help them progress in their development and uh, make sure you've got the right soldiers right skills for the right task at any one time so your it's engineering management is, is the yeah. sort of true perspective uh, and then we also do a, a set of jobs we call staff uh, appointments in uh, for officers in the army which is where you go and help the army run itself as an organization and as business and again there's a huge variety of jobs you can end up doing uh and i've ended up in the ones that tend to be more technical because of my background and the fact that i'm a mechanical engineer uh and so i currently work in in uh, procurement of equipment um and the modernization of the army's um kit and equipment uh, and also their training and infrastructure is is the is the area in which i work at the moment so the army's going through a big transition at the moment trying to modernize all of its kit and equipment how it trains uh, and how its infrastructure supports our soldiers soldiers and what we do uh, and i work uh, at a sort of cross-cutting level looking at all of those there's 32 big big programs trying to deliver all that transformation and i look across all of those and try and help each of those programs solve issues and challenges they've got and work with the field army to make sure we're delivering the right kit and equipment into service in the, in the right timelines uh, without disrupting uh, army readiness uh, as well so it's a fascinating job but it's it's wow. Technical, uh, it's full on. <laughs> and, and there's a vast number of people that support all of that process <clears throat> to bring it all together but it's it, yeah it's a really really interesting role you mean it was the ultimate problem solver what if you got any stories um i don't know we've got to get a tank across a river and we've only got some bamboo sticks or something like that Please you just get i'll pull it guys i'll just pull it yeah. back off sort this out. yeah i just wonder <laughs> if there's like a highlight like that you could share with us Oh, there's been there are so many bizarre situations that you find yourself in, uh, and that's the joy of working with really intelligent soldiers is they they apply their brains as well and work out how to solve these problems. But I think one of the ones that I I always look back on really fondly when we were out in Iraq, we were up in a place called Al Amara, um, and the threat uh, we're so you're quite isolated from Basra. It's, it's quite a long. Um, uh, long distance between the two uh, and the threat from mines on the road was increasing quite a lot and we didn't at that time have a, a mine plow in service for our our vehicles armored vehicles that we had up there um so i i yeah we sat down with some of my um tradesmen who's a metalsmith a, um, a welder by trade uh and designed a mine plow that we wow. fixed onto some of our armored vehicles so you could basically push the mines out of the way as they were moving up and down the road and that was just an interim design until we could get a proper piece of equipment into service and brought out to iraq to support us but it's that sort of problem solving from a technical perspective uh, that is is just fantastic and then there's also the other extreme. I've I've, I've done roles. Uh, I've been an instructor at Sandhurst, um, and the problem solving of working with such a fantastic mix of people, all different backgrounds, different uh, different ways of thinking, and trying to help them work through to be the best they can in that training environment and to be good officers when they leave. Uh, and that that's a real challenge in its own right. What what investment do they need at what time, and how can you help them progress? Uh, bearing in mind they're all so different and they don't necessarily think the same way that I think. So yeah, yeah do you say do you say to them, look, ultra running, it's the way forward, guys. If you all <laughs> do this, <laughs> I keep saying that, but they're not convinced. <laughs> they all think I'm completely mad. It's fantastic. Like, you know, psychologists and super practical too. I think the mix of those skills are amazing. Do you think being a soldier, you know, and the type of training you've been exposed to helps during these epic races you know three the under the summer spine winter spine and the silver northern traverse uh yeah do you think it helps with these super duper long races yeah definitely um i, I think some of the skills we learn when we go through training about how to 
we talk about being in the field is when we're on exercise and in training but when we're taught how to look after yourself in the field and that's one of the really basic skills as a soldier so that you can keep your feet dry you can um, do your own first aid you know when to put warm kit dry kit on off depending on the conditions you you make sure you're eating and drinking uh, all of your your admin so that your kit's put away in the right way. We're taught all of those as an absolute foundation. Uh, so I think those skills definitely map across. We talk to navigate, we're used to being out on the ground in really difficult weather conditions. We're used to being up at really random times of night, um, being out on patrol. Basically and- the spine, it's just yeah. you're just living <laughs> the <laughs> spine continuously. <laughs> just the burgundy's a bit bigger when you're doing military training. But- <laughs> Do you get a bit judgy though if you see somebody's mess at militant strewn all over the floor and you think oh i wouldn't uh, be doing my admin like that oh no i can see the logic with having everything out you can see it <laughs> <laughs> i just think i can do that because i just need to have everything yeah. tidied away a bit but uh but yeah everyone's but you but i say even though i've learned all those skills you'll see someone doing something that's different you go oh that's such a good idea i never never thought of it that way or never thought of the logic behind that but but i i, I genuinely think so much of what i've learned in 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 the army has definitely helped me with looking after myself on those longer races. And that's probably why the longer races suit me because I can't run fast, but at least I can look after myself. I think you can. Um, I made great friends with, is it is Leon one of your soldiers? Is that the relationship? Leon and I, at my last job, I was a brigade commander of a logistic brigade um, and Leon worked with me then uh, in that job. Uh, so he was my training warrant officer in that role. So that's where I got to know him. Uh, and then we realised we were both into ultra running. So we spent lots of time chatting. Um, and then since then, it's been fantastic because we he's either been supporting a race that I've been running or mm. vice versa, or we're just catching up with sort of how the training is going. Uh, so yeah, he's, it's been really great to get to know him. Well, he said the same thing about you. And he said you would given him heaps and heaps of tips going into the spine. And I definitely learned loads of, from him. Firstly, <laughs> I learned how fast you can walk because he can walk so fast and when I I sort of like I literally like cross from Jacob's ladder I cross paths with him so much and I remember like running behind him along the paving slabs and he was walking but I was like this is the fastest man I've ever seen walk um and also just his ad I'd watch him (laughs) And I'd be like in checkpoints watching him going, oh, my God, you're so good at your admin. And then be like, come on, Eddie, sort your own admin out. He was so good as admin. But one of his biggest things was when we got, especially after like the Hadrian's Wall section, was he was so good at when we got to like the lowest points and you're just moving so slow. And he'd be like, right, stop. We need to we need to melt the snow. We need to melt water. We need to do this now. And he was so good at like, instead of me and David would be like just sitting in the snow going, we just need 10 minutes. Just give us 10 minutes. He'd be like, right, well, I'm doing the water. I'm going to do this. You do this. And I was like, this is, he was really, that's the soldier training coming out instead of just lying there. He was always on it. And, and the biggest thing was he introduced fisherman's friends into uh, into my life, which was again. Are you a fisherman friends? Do you? Use well, I didn't know about them until you mentioned them. So oh, I took some on the Northern Traverse. In fact, he gave me some to take on the Northern Traverse. <laughs> I presumed it was a it was an army thing when he because he was like, but, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I love it. This is new. Maybe they need to be part of ration packs now as well because they're quite a game changer for the middle yeah, of the night. And now I often get messages from people saying, "Fisherman's friends changed my race." <laughs> Um, let's go back. Can we talk a little bit about your race resume? Because I've got so many questions, but I think I need a logical order and otherwise we'll be here all day. So winter spine uh-huh. came before the summer spine right yes. now. Yes. Um, was that your first foray into like super long distance, the winter spine? Okay. Well, it's the first race, yes. So yeah. I had done one event before, um, which I really early on after I did my first ultra I wanted to fundraise for the Alzheimer's Society because at the time I'd had, had Alzheimer's um and dad and I love the Lake District all our family do, do so we I thought that would be an amazing route to do to do some charitable fundraising so I covered the route um sort of run walking uh, in a slightly different rhythm so I have done the route once before but that wasn't a race it didn't have the same sort of support wrap uh, that a race would have but, but the first race long race absolutely was the uh, winter spine and I did the Lakeland 100 the summer before because I just thought I needed to get something that was 
longer in the mm. bank before yeah. I attempted to do the whole yeah. spine. Yeah. And how did that winter spine go? Did you love it? Was it a shock? It, uh, it took me ages to really understand what, what it was that I'd achieved at the end of it. Yeah. I think yeah, when I, I finished, that. it was it was a bit, I was just a bit overwhelmed by it all and I couldn't mm. process how far I had really gone. <laughs> and I couldn't process the highs and lows of the route as well. And I, I think I just sort of blocked some of the bad bits um, in my head yeah. um, from, from <laughs> that route. And, but I think I knew deep down, I felt that I could complete the distance as long as the weather didn't conspire against me or I didn't get an injury or something like that. I thought if I, if I can keep myself you know, healthy uh, during the distance and I can complete it, uh, but I never imagined in, in a month of Sundays that I would have ended up on a podium finish on that sort of a race. And I and I felt, I, I genuinely felt as if I sort of got there by accident because of other people's misfortune in front of me that have had well, injuries. Well, it, it's and... a tricky one, that, isn't it? Because yeah. you feel like, well, there were people in front, but you've got to be in it to win it. And And with the spine, it's all about patience isn't it and playing you know the first hundred miles is just let's just get into this and so you can it's not as you know now you've reflected on it I'm sure you're like no no I it, I finished because I handled the whole race so well I didn't just run really well for 100 miles but it's a it's a it's a funny mentality to get your head around isn't it yeah and there's the, and there was the, the pacing thing I was really conscious of and I just kept saying to myself a number of instances one of the checkpoints I'd gone into I think it was uh was it Hawes I think it was Hawes and uh, Elaine um this one was just leaving uh Nikki Summers was just leaving and I just arrived um and I remember thinking then you know if I was racing this I, I would know be I, I know going. that feeling yeah and I thought no I'm not going to because I want to finish this because I don't know if I can finish it and mm. it was a conscious decision mm. and I thought it did it was the right decision mm. uh but I did reflect afterwards thinking oh god was I not being competitive enough was mm. I not you mm. know trying hard enough and I was like no no it's the right thing because I was really tired I desperately needed some sleep and I needed to stop for a bit so yeah so that was very conscious for that that event was to finish uh, and to mm, yeah. part of the experience and I definitely had some yeah, really tortuous lows of you know it's so far to go <laughs> and I tried not to think beyond the section I was on and each of the sections I'd broken down into a number of mini RVs in my head of oh, wow. being markers that I had to get to on the way so I was never thinking more than about seven miles of mm. that was the next stage I had to get through before the next five miles or six miles or whatever my mental marker was but again and I spent a lot of that race on my own that was I just, I often end up that way. I'm sort of, I'm not near the front runners. And I just end up in a sort of a, a bit of a, a vacuum in the middle. But I I felt quite comfortable with that, apart from probably a bit on Hadrian's, just after the, the, the diversion off Hadrian's Wall, which we had to do that year after Storm Arwen. And that was a terrible bit because there was no event support out there. I was totally on my own, middle of the night, and I was falling asleep. It was bitterly cold. It was thick mud. I felt like I was going backwards. And I kept looking at my GPS thinking, I've just got to find some shelter. When does this end? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Later going backwards. I was walking forwards, and it was flying me backwards. I was like, I'm just not oh. moving. <laughs> I thought I was going mad. But you get through all of those. And, and I think someone has said to me before I started it was, just keep moving. And even if it's slow, just keep moving keep moving forwards and it will get better. I think, was it John Kelly or someone who said that? But it doesn't matter how bad it is, there will always be someone that's worse than you and there will always be a bit that will get better. You know, the sun will come up, something will get better. So just oh, wait for that yeah. bit to happen and then yeah. you'll yeah. focus on that. Oh, I'm getting all tingly. I was reliving bits then as you were describing to me. So amazing, amazing achievement in your first winter span and your first crack at like a really long distance event. And then what was the thinking about then going into the summer spine <laughs> explain, Sorry, the madness. No <laughs> explain the madness to me yeah so i'd entered the winter spine the for the year before uh, but it got cancelled because of covid uh, and my logic with doing the winter spine was i knew it was going to be really painful and i thought if if I did the summer spine first, the chance of me then wanting to do something that was harder and then do the winter spine, I'll never do it. I so I thought you. the logic yep. was do the winter because then the summer's got to be better because the weather's hopefully would be slightly more civilised. And then it ended up being the sequencing that I, in fact, I'd done support crew on the, the summer before. And then I thought, well, I might as well sign up for the summer 
um, without really thinking about the practicalities of finishing a winter and then going straight into a summer. And then it was in my diary and I just thought, well, I'll, I'll give it a go and see if it is better, if it's easier <laughs> by doing it in the summer. Uh, so that was really the only logic, but certainly in the run up to the summer one, I was like, I have no idea what I was thinking. What? <laughs> Why have I ended this? <laughs> yeah, because presumably it doesn't give you a huge amount of time saying it takes like maybe two, three months to recover from the winter mentally as well as physically and then you've got to put that backpack back on oh my goodness i'd never really I thought of the timeline it. I <laughs> it. tell us now tell us the findings because this is something i know lots of people lots of people enter the summer spine thinking it will be easier what are the differences well there's lots of factors um i'll talk a little bit about the build-up to it actually first yes, and then do it yes the spine, but the the, i've been carrying a knee injury when i did the winter spine um for about six nine months um which i'd been managing uh so i consciously decided after the winter spine i was going to take time out and do the rehab properly uh, so i didn't run for three months um and i was just in the gym doing weights doing rehab but i felt a lot stronger having done all of the rehab mm-hmm. and then it would so i only had you know, just under three months then of getting back into running before doing the summer spine so i was really conscious that whilst i might be stronger I didn't feel running strong uh, going into the summer spine. So again, I was pretty cautious about what I was going to going to achieve. And it, so my mindset again was just try and finish it on the back of the fact I've only had less than three months of running. Um, and so I, I didn't enter it thinking I'm just going to go out and race this. Uh, it, was, it was just another mindset of trying to finish it. Um, and I... I underestimated how different the summer spine would be. I knew it would be different. I knew there'd be challenges of it being hotter, um, needing more water. Um, but I was really looking forward to the fact that the days were longer, so you mm. didn't need your torch for so long. You you could see further. You could see where you're going. I thought that was going to be great. Um, but the realities were um, it was a lot hotter than I anticipated, so that was quite a shock to the system, just how how exposed we were on that event last was it last year? Uh, yeah, yeah, last yeah. Uh, uh, how exposed we were on that that event, and just the sun beating down. And I was in shorts the whole way through, and I I never wear shorts, um, so that's really unusual for me to have done a race that late, <laughs> to be that tired, and still be in shorts at the finish. So that that just took a yeah, just trying to worrying about where you're next going to get water from was yeah. was one of the big factors yeah. in that. The ability about being able to see, which whilst it was lovely having daylight, what I realised on things like the Cam High Road, actually being able to see where you're going was awful. <laughs> It's like I wondered see. that because like the camera oh, high road, I had no idea it was snowing. So mm-hmm. all I did was like, right, five miles head down. Yeah. And it's almost good because you're just in and like that bit after Hadrian's Wall, you just head down and you can't see yeah. for what, 90 percent of the race. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, so, so that surprised me a bit because all like Cam High Road, all I could see was just this never-ending road that stretched on and so on. I don't even know what it looks like. Yeah, is it and just it was... a long road? <laughs> yeah, it is, and it just disappeared up into the horizon, and the sun was beating down, and I was like, oh god, I need <laughs> need to find a river to put my to put my feet in or something like that. So that bit that sort of surprised me, but being able to see the scenery that's that's mm. one of the reasons I do this is because I love. I love being outside and seeing these beautiful places. So I could genuinely enjoy that in the summer with the, the fantastic views. It is so beautiful and people can come out and see you at more random times because it's yeah, daylight. It's easier there's probably for more people, more people, mm. which isn't good and bad in some ways, I yeah. guess, but more life around than... Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. There was there was less um, support from the spine community. Yeah. So the yeah, mountain rescue weren't out in the same way. See so all those little stops you have on the winter spine. You get a cup of tea and then off, off you go. None of that was there, and I'd sort of assumed it would be. Yeah. So that was a bit of a disappointment. The slaggy fell angel wasn't there, and I, I I ran past there and I was like, oh my you goodness, she's not there. <laughs> <laughs> so things like that that I'd sort of in my head were going to be really big things to look forward to then then didn't happen yeah and the the other side of it was the heat and I got really nauseous on that race oh, for the yeah. first time and I was just struggling to work out how to cope with it it's first time it happened you know and I, I was like a child trying to eat food knowing I had to eat but was really struggling to oh. chew it and swallow it and just sort of force feeding these crumbs of flapjack in and things just to get anything down but I was okay in the checkpoint so I could still eat the solids in the checkpoint it was just the sort of the snacks on the way were were more tricky so that was a whole learning curve uh, and I ended up running with a guy funny enough he lives in a village 
two villages away from me. Uh, we, we met on the trail, worked out we both came from a sort of similar place and realised I drive past his house every day. <laughs> <laughs> we never met before. Um, but he gave me some little snacks. I think we were uh, it's up on Hadrian's Wall area uh, and he had a little bag. They were, I think, they're like the, uh, the Grey's... Um, savory snacks and the really crunchy, the corn, coated corn thing. Oh, really. yeah, yeah. And he was like, I really don't like them. Do you want to try them? And I had two of them because they were crunchy and they were savory. I was like, oh, this is hard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he looked at me and was like, do you want some more? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I nicked all of his savory snacks he didn't like. <laughs> um, and that was just transformational. And, and I got a, managed to steal a peanut butter sandwich at, um, at Bellingham uh, to take up onto the Cheviots. And again, that was my treat, knowing I had a peanut butter a lot of sandwich in my in my bag so I sort of managed to find ways to cope as I went further on uh, on the race but but yeah that was just a bit confusing because all the things I normally liked I just didn't want to eat couldn't couldn't face the thought of eating yeah so lots of challenges on that that event I sort of felt a lot stronger and I ended up running with Andy for much quite a lot of the race in the end once we I think we met around uh, somewhere on our way into Hawes, I think we met there. And then we pretty much ran either yeah, together. Yeah, after or... Hawes, you pretty much yeah. settled in your, you see the same people come into yeah. checkpoints, people are just leaving. Yeah. There's no massive disruptions really, no. is there? There's yeah. a group of about six of us and we just yeah. cycling around <laughs> each other. Um, and, and that was actually quite nice because that was the first time I'd really had people to run with. And mm. it really helped me when I was having my low point to know that somebody else was around, I could always, they sort of, metaphorically pull me along because I was trying to keep up with them or trying to catch them up or trying to keep ahead of them and not let myself drop back so that was a that was a nice experience of just having others around and close enough that I could try and keep contact with them so if you had to do one again which one winter or summer (laughs) um, I think probably the winter if I'm honest it's such a challenge and I think everyone says why do you do it and I I don't know I've listened to all the podcasts and the people say why they do it but I think you just want to do something that really really challenges you and the winter spine really really challenged me Uh, and I think I've still got more that it could challenge me in Uh, so I yeah maybe another winter spine in there something about being out in weather where no one else is out yeah. and you know that um and it's sort of like a battle and you've got to survive that and also i quite like the fact that the drinking and the eating is like the least of your problems in the winter spine because you don't really need to drink that much because you're definitely not sweating um and if you eat enough at the checkpoints you're pretty well f- as long as you can get the snacks in in between you're pretty well fueled aren't you though i could now imagine that being such a chat on the summer you've got so long without any water I Mm. think I that would consume me it would be all I could think about was the fact Mm. that I was trying to search desperately for water because it's not even like you've got heaps of it's not being like in the Lake District is it there's not heaps of places to fill up water um no exactly And, and and some of the places where there is water it's pretty pretty grim it's not stuff I would choose to drink no, it's stuff in a when you when you lift up your salmon soft flask and there's bits That's the thing swimming around in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's alive. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah. done a few of those and I've been like, just drink it. It doesn't keep you alive. Uh let's move on then now to the northern traverse. Uh why the northern traverse? And then just tell us, yeah, how was the journey? You did amazing. You absolutely smashed that. I was so proud of you. Um, yeah, what what sort of what sort of caught your attention about this route? Uh, I think it was the history of having done the Wainwright Coast to Coast that once before. Um, okay. That was that was the history as to why I was interested in it. Um, but I'd never even heard of the Northern Traverse as a race until a couple of years ago because I'm so I still feel so new to ultra running that <laughs> there's all these surprises all the time. People mention a race I've never heard of. Like, oh, that sounds really exciting. <laughs> so I didn't discover that until I think somebody mentioned it. Uh, must have been last year uh, after the spine in fact somebody mentioned it and then I was dot watching last year's Northern Traverse so I thought oh that would be great uh, so that's why I entered it and it was sort of the timing wise I th- thought would work that I wanted to do something that wasn't quite as wintry as the winter spine mm. but it wasn't slap bang in the middle of the summer. Did and you just... prepare for it the same way as you did the spine? E- yes yeah similar uh, so I got a coach um, the, for the first time after the initial, the first spine I was supposed to do that got cancelled because of COVID, I then got a coach after that because I thought, actually, whilst I was ready to go to the start line, I knew I wasn't as well prepared as I could have been, but probably a lot of that was COVID. But I thought, let's just invest in getting somebody who knows what they're doing to 
to hold me to account with training because there's bits that I know I should be doing that I equally know I will never do unless somebody's checking up on me. And so that was really the reason for getting a coach was to get that accountability and the rigor into the program. So I've been working with her for a year. So I knew sort of what the structure of training was going to be. And by that point, she'd really got to know me. And I'd also, I've got a little bit more confidence in listening to my body and what it's telling me and not being slavish to what the program says. If, if, if I want to go and do a three hour hike rather than a three hour run, that's okay. So I'm a little bit more comfortable with that now as before, I, that awful guilt trip of knowing you're supposed to be doing something and you just don't feel like it. And then you end up actually doing nothing because you procrastinate or I do. <laughs> procrastinate yeah. for so long, I don't take myself out. And it's just, I'm just going to do something, get yourself out the door, then see how you feel and then it might turn into a run. So I think that that relationship of growth quite well in knowing me trusting myself but also my coach's program was working for me so yes so the, the build-up was very similar it but less from from my coach's perspective she labored less about carrying load but I was really conscious of the need to carry the load so I I put the full load on relatively early before races and and just get used to training with it just so I'm comfortable with the pack uh, and where things are in the pack it's the admin thing but, but yeah very sort of similar training with the same base level and then the longer runs the back-to-back longer stuff at the weekends and that's all I can manage around work to be honest there's only ever really weekends I can do that but this year I was really lucky I had some leave from work that I hadn't been expecting to be able to take but my boss said to me just go and take your leave so that gave me a bit of time to actually just be out in the hills a lot more and it wasn't that I I was still doing the same training program but I had more time to recover so I wasn't Mm. rushing into work and then having a long day at work being really tired and then dragging myself out to go and train at the weekends I was a bit more refreshed you're a pro you're a pro it felt like it being a pro (laughs) athlete for a couple of weeks <laughs> and, uh, and then how did the race sounds like you're quite well prepared going into it how did the race pan out is it the same sort of format in that you work towards the big sort of checkpoints and then you can reset and move on it's it's similar but but different so they, they the lakes traverse is on at the same time uh so you're going through the same checkpoint so there's more checkpoints in the beginning up until shack when the lake traverse finished so they they're more regular, more frequent um, on that first bit. And your drop bag doesn't meet you at every checkpoint because the lakes traverse don't have a drop bag. So <laughs> it was every other checkpoint for the first bit. So that required a little bit of thinking to make sure you're picking up snacks for two checkpoints worth mm-hmm. when you do see your drop bag, as it were, just to make sure you got, got that right. <laughs> In the end, I didn't end up eating a fraction of what I was carrying, so it didn't really matter. <laughs> um, but um, and then after Shack, when it's just the Northern Traverse that are running, then you see your drop bag at every checkpoint, uh, and there's a bit more space. Then there's less people in the checkpoints uh, to to do your admin and turn yourself around before you before you move on. There's there are six checkpoints in total, um, and the facilities are um, a little bit different to the spine. So you're in tented accommodation. If you want to sleep, there's a tent outside. Uh, which is a, is a plus and a minus because you you've got to blow up your air mats and all those sorts of things, which is just a bit of a faff. Uh, and then if it's cold, then you're going to go and try and sleep in a cold tent uh, in the middle of the night. So that, those are sort of I hadn't again really thought about that. Uh, and you can rest on the trail if you want, but you don't have have to carry a sleeping system, unlike okay. the spine. Yeah, a lot more kit for the spine. Uh, so th- those are sort of the main main differences. And I adopted exactly the same approach of knowing where the checkpoints were and then breaking down the route um, in between that uh, for little mini checkpoints in my head of where I was aiming to. Uh, I don't really run to a a schedule. Um, I think about it before, but I don't, when I'm running, I don't, I just go with the flow and how I feel and who I'm with and, and try and enjoy it. Um, And um, uh, yeah, so the the beginning of that race is through the Lake District, which is my 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 treat. Is where I love to be. I love the really technical terrain. There's nothing I love more than hopping around on rocks. That's my thing that I really really love, and I find flat horrendous. So <laughs> I hate flat <that> roads. <laughs> they terrify me because everyone else is just really fast. I just find it really really hard work, uh, and I love running downhill as well. And and hiking uphill is is you know is sort of fine. So the Lake District was really the bit that I was most looking forward to. It's and it was- that bit comes first, and then. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it's also, it's got the biggest hill, so I felt you've you've done the big stuff first, yeah, it's out yeah. of the way, uh, and knowing when you're a little bit more fresh at that point, 
was was quite reassuring. Um, and we had the most amazing weather. It was much better than the forecast because the forecast, I think, was clear and dry, but it wasn't particularly warm. But the sun was out all the way through. And it was really hot the first day, which threw me quite a lot. So I was, I was still in winter leggings. Um, shorts, was, not the shorts back on. Oh, they, definitely not. they burn <laughs> after the summer's <laughs> <laughs> no, they still, still get recycled. Um, and I was wearing a thin, a really fine little merino base layer and a long sleeve top over the top of that. And so I sort of set off that morning and I got up the first and I was like, I'm quite warm. <laughs> so I was like, oh God. Because um, some of the runners were in shorts and little vest tops and things. I was like, blimey, I wasn't. But because the wind chill on the tops, I knew was going to yeah, be cold. Yeah. And it's that balance of how hot do you get in the lower bits before you hit the wind chill on the And higher. the last thing you want to be doing is moving because you're cold. Like, oh, I'm chilly, so I'm going to move faster because you just yeah. can't, you can't afford. That's fine if you're doing 100K. Mm. You want, you were like, yeah, keep, keep vesting. Yeah racing shorts i'd be in my crop top and my my uh cycle is a sprint but <laughs> yeah. do both races start together though the uh lakes and the northern traverse are they both set off at the same time uh there's an hour difference so the okay. lakes traverse go go first so i was just heading down to the start when they were leaving it was quite funny because there's a, a couple of guys one guy ran past me and i thought he was i'd met him on the bus the day before i thought he was on the same race as me and he said oh, i overslept i overslept i was like that's all right oh, you've got time don't panic <laughs> and then he literally the, the buzzer the horn thing went for the start and then he ran past me and ran straight through the start line off he went and I was like oh you're an electrobus that's the way to do it <laughs> yeah. and this Perfect. nervous anticipation I was gonna say but, um yeah imagine his adrenaline was probably quite high in trying to even make it to the start line on time he was but definitely yeah. sweating he was sweating at the top yeah. of that first climb yeah yeah definitely yes yeah, so it's an hour difference so I I guess that there was a chance that we'd meet some of the the tail of the lakes traverse relatively early. And that's actually just quite looking forward to that because it's always nice having somebody on the trail chat. and be yeah. able to say well done to them and just have a little catch up as, as, as you go. Um, and then I, you know, anticipated there'll be a sort of front cohort of the Northern Traverse that I probably never ever see. Um, and then you've got that normal sort of shuffling around in the middle, which is where I anticipated being. So yes, you've got quite a lot of people on the trail in the in the on the first 24 hours. Um, but it which probably the uh, it wasn't really a bottleneck, but the bit which was closest to a bottleneck was along Ennerdale Water. It's oh, a yeah, relatively it's narrow, sort of rocky narrow. track, yeah. and it's not easy to pass unless you put a lot of effort in. And I didn't really want to expend mm. energy in overtaking people because <laughs> you, you do that and then you fall back. Um, but that was the closest to a bottleneck, and there were just a, quite a few people along there. But that was actually it was quite nice because as a beautiful weather, you enjoy the scenery and just settle into a bit of a rhythm there. Um, and I was running with Nikki Summers from the beginning, um, and we were just chatting away. And I was listening to um, a couple, um, Alison Walker uh, drop back and joined us for a bit. Uh, Ian Keith was up there as well, which frightened the life out of me. Because I, mean, I, yes, I saw I'm like, that. I was part of the race. <laughs> It's just like, what am I doing here? But I was listening to him. He was chatting about nutrition uh, with another runner. It's just fascinating hearing his perspective on nutrition. Yeah. And, uh, so I was just earwigging into these little conversations, uh, which which just made the time go. Uh, and I just enjoyed being in the lakes. It was uh, it was just beautiful, beautiful weather that first day. And I felt strong. I loved the run down from Honister down to Rossway. And I know Rossway really, really well. It's a really special place to me. You know, turned around, uh, one of my friends at Checkpoint, which is always lovely when you've got a friendly face there. And then headed on up to Green Up Edge. And that's, it, again, a very, very special place to me where Dad and I used to uh, always walk when when I was little. Uh, and we had a tradition uh, of him heading off up. He'd always go first and mum wasn't allowed to let me go until he'd headed up. We'd walk over to Grassmere to go and get our Grassmere gingerbread for our holiday treats. Okay. And um, so I'd you know, fast walk up behind him and, and I always meet people coming the other way that had said, oh, I've just met your dad. Uh, he was talking about you. So uh, so I always loved that spot. And I stopped there just for a moment when I got to the top at Green Up Edge. All of that's really familiar. So I love being on that bit of the train. And I ended up with a few different runners uh, with me at the time. So just nice sort of chatting away and just enjoying being somewhere special. So that first bit all just felt Felt lovely, felt good. Yeah, Patterdale was a fairly quick turnaround. Nikki Summers came in as I was 
I was in there still eating. So I knew she was pretty close behind me all the way through. And then as we headed up uh, over towards, uh, what was it, Horswater, really misty that, that first night. So the temperature dropped quite a bit heading up there. The, the mist came in and you've got all that, the challenge when your torch is just reflecting off the mm. mist. You're desperately trying to see a path that I knew wasn't clear. But you can't actually see anything because your torch is just bouncing back at you. And, and there's a little, I caught up with a group of Lakes Traverse. So we all worked together sort of to, find our way through that and there's some quite technical bits on that that some of them didn't like so one of us would go out in front and just find the route so they could worry about their feet and slightly and not worry about where they were going so that was really nice sort of bit of teamwork up there just all getting each other through until we you know, got over the other side down into Horswater and then the course all got much more spread out at that point so I spent most of the night going across Otley Moor on my own uh, which is always a bit of a low point the, the witching hour of three o'clock four o'clock in the morning and you're on your own and you, you're sleepy and all that sort of bit um, is is always a challenge but it was a clear night as well so I could see the odd torch in front of me every now and again which is quite nice to know that someone's out there yeah <laughs> somewhere <I'm not. laughs> my, my gps isn't making it up completely yeah. um and uh yeah so and then i think after that um yeah i'd sort of docked into a, a, a group of people coming into kirkby stephen uh ran with them for a bit the next day uh so again it was nice to have some company uh and then i ended up on the final bit being back on my own again so the last 40 odd miles from Nordstones to the finish I was completely on my own the whole way didn't see another runner do you feel like you're in a race there's so much time on your own are you still mindful yes I'm racing or it's more an adventure um I think on the northern traverse I was more mindful of the fact I was trying to race but I struggled at certain times because of being tired or falling asleep on my feet but I think because Nikki was so close and, and yeah. Nikki's a great friend she's such a lovely person that there was sort of half of me that would be lovely thinking it'd be great to be with her but another half of me thinking think of the glory if, if, I, glory, <laughs> if, I, if I can keep where I am and I just didn't expect to be there and therefore it's just that little inner competitiveness that kicks in and you're like well you, you could do this you might be able to do this but I couldn't afford to be complacent no yeah, yeah. you couldn't think about it, it had to no I didn't want to think about it too much I was just trying to yeah. keep moving on that last leg because I was I didn't really stop for long at Lordstones because it was so cold. It's they're in they set up a marquee, but it was freezing and it had been below freezing the night before. So I got in. As soon as I stopped, my core temperature plummeted mm. and I was ended up eating cold rice pudding and cold tea because by the time it got to me, it, it, it was that cold. It, the temperature dropped in the food and the drink, and I was just like, I can't stop. I've got to go. So yeah, I yeah. Shoveled yeah. some stuff down and ran out the door. I was like, I'm really sorry. I've got to go. Yeah. Um, and so I was really tired. I hadn't. I, I planned to get you know a, a short nap, but didn't. So I just thought I'll just press on and the sun was coming up so it felt like a good time to keep moving but definitely on that last leg I had periods of time where I was just sort of zigzagging all over the place because I wasn't really awake wasn't really with it yeah it where am like I going am I... and I was struggling to motivate myself but then when I bumped into Mark's parents because I knew he was close behind because they said oh we're just waiting for our son he's just behind you I was like ah <laughs> wake up and then suddenly I was like ah I'm back in yeah that's amazing <laughs> and then, then I picked up again and I was like oh that's it I'm, I'm, I'm alert again and I'm with it and I can keep moving and then that sort of stuck with me uh pretty much to the finish until a couple of blisters I had that burst and then that properly woke me up <laughs> it's just like ah oh. <laughs> what about hallucinations did you have any hallucinations i don't think i hallucinate per se i've never seen anything really really random but you definitely i definitely have the challenge of looking at something and i can't tell what it is that i can see and it looks like something else so the one that made me laugh most was on the on the route from lord stones to lion's inn uh again i was completely on my own there's a number of um, I think they, yeah, they were cans along the side, but they look like little men with bobble hats on because they were stacked up with a <laughs> big stone, little stone. <laughs> look at these going. There's clearly nobody sat there with a bobble hat on, but there's like three of them up in front of me. <laughs> Kept Fantastic. looking at eyes, just like that, that definitely. No, no, it's not a man with a bobble hat on. <laughs> that just made me laugh with all these little bobble hats all the way up there. <laughs> oh, time for tea. Um, yeah. I've got, we've got a couple of Patreon questions to ask you. Some of these you've sort of answered a little bit, but um, but we can pull out little bits that I've still I still got some questions too. Susan Wilson says, brilliant achievement. And how on earth do you balance pace, covering such mileage and deciding to sleep or not to sleep for how long and when? Um, and then she's given you tapping emojis. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Like, do you make a plan for sleeping? 
or when you get like you just said you you didn't sleep at that last checkpoint how did the sleep work out or do you just go with wh- how you feel my logic is i'd rather if i'm going to rest at all i want to rest at a checkpoint because i don't want to faff around on the trail unnecessarily but that's different if it's warm but um but certainly winter events i don't want to sleep so I, and i know i can get through the first 24 hours without sleeping even though i'll have a, a tired bit i know i can get through that first 24 hours so i don't plan to sleep until the second night then my logic is that i'll probably need to sleep somewhere but it really depends on where i am on the course mm. Mm. and even though i might have an outline plan of where i might be the practical reality is i've got no idea where i'm going to be yeah yeah eight hours into a race absolutely no idea so it's luck of the draw uh, and luckily i went into richmond at the right time it was I think I got there about seven in the evening, six in the evening, something like that. Um, so it was going into nighttime. So I thought I would rest there, uh, which I did. I ne- nearly screwed up the whole race plan at that point. Um, uh, and then after that, because this is was a slightly shorter race and I knew roughly how much further I had to go, I reckoned I could possibly get in before the next night. But I think if I'd... Um, if it was a longer race or I was moving slower, I would have had to assume I'd needed a- another... You know, short sleep at yeah. the second night there on in so that, that's roughly what I work to and this time I tried because the weather was reasonable although the wind chill was quite cold I did one of those sort of micro nap things um after lying in because I was really sleepy and I knew I wasn't moving well so I knew I just needed to get a little bit of sleep so I just curled up on a pile of heather kept my pack on and it was in the sun it was like a cat and <laughs> literally find the sunny spot out of the wind and curled up literally five ten minutes and then carried on which was enough just to sort of again kickstart me and so that's that's roughly what I work to but how long I sleep for at the checkpoints I've definitely not got that right yet i Still not quite sure how it works. When I did the spine, I I didn't sleep much, even though I rested. I really struggled to sleep because I had those weird mm. body and leg pains that you get. And I just, even though I was tired, I couldn't sleep. But this time, certainly at Richmond, I did actually manage to sleep, um, which was a relief because I felt amazing when I left Richmond, which made up for the possibly having stopped for too long. Um, but then I, my body just felt like I was at the beginning of the race and I flew off out of Richmond. It was just like, oh, this is amazing. I made the most of this for as long as I can. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fine balance, that, that the sleep pattern. And then the pacing, I think for me, it's about listening to my body and just not pushing too hard at the beginning. And I've learned on the hills, I love going up hills um, when I'm hiking because I can hike reasonably comfortably but not pushing too hard so if I'm out really out puff then I'm pushing too hard so I just rein back slightly on the hills and then just try and enjoy the rest of it and again just don't push too hard too early so the first 100 miles is just sort of just go with your body see how you feel and then recalibrate at the 100 mile point and think well how am I feeling now and then the bits where you're really and I know there'll be bits where I'm really struggling to move fast and then it's just about keeping moving so I know the pace is going to vary as you go through mm-hmm. the race um so it's yeah it's not it's not a science definitely it's it's still a it's still an art that I'm I'm still learning to draw let alone paint so um <laughs> I haven't got it right. But <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, but it, and also it's different every race. So it's not yeah. like you can say, well, this is my pacing. This is my sleep strategy. It's completely different to every race, terrain, weather, where you arrive in the checkpoints. I still laugh because when I set my alarm on my phone every night, I've got the most random times for alarms to wake up that are from the <laughs> sky. Where it'd be like 1121 <laughs> PM, get up. I'm like, oh God, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a couple more uh patreon questions actually one of them you've already answered actually as far as the sleeping is concerned but yeah Kirsty barker and joanne hazlitt uh well, well done so impressive uh what are your top checkpoint admin tips and uh yeah do you have a routine when you just go into the checkpoint uh, do you have a little list that you tick off as you as you go uh, i do have a little list i had one for the spine which i sort of taped into my bag um and to be fair i didn't really need it but i just think the process of writing the list was really helpful and knowing it was there if i was really tired and wasn't thinking straight um so my admin logic which i said before is all from my military training is um doing as much concurrent activity as I can um, and also knowing what's going to take the longest to do and getting that started first. 
Uh, so as I'm coming into a checkpoint, I know if it's been a night run, I know the bits that are going to take the longest is charging, kit and equipment, so getting your torch. Oh, in. so long to get your head around the wires and the, where yeah. everything is. Yeah. Get all those plugged in for simultaneously whilst one of the lovely support crew are getting you some food. And then, then it's about doing everything concurrently. So I will be eating and drinking and doing my feet, which might sound a bit minging at the same time, but <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be doing <laughs> all three normal at the to same me. time. And every now and again, I'm like, oh, I forgot to drink. And then... Um, so you're just doing as much as you can at the same time. And then the final bit of admin, I think, that I always try and work to, because it works for me, is that everything's got a, got its place and everything in its place. Mm. So there's a reason why everything's where it is. And then if you need something, you take it out, do it, use it, and then put it straight back so that you're not – I don't then have to faff around with repacking the bag. I think it was um, – was it one of your podcasts? Um, was it? It might have been John who made some comment about being kind to your future self. Was that his phrase? It's great, yeah. My phrase. yeah. It's my phrase. It's okay. what I do when when Bryn's away. Yeah. I do. I do when I want to go to bed, but mm-hmm. I still need the dishwasher needs unpacking, the laundry yeah. needs folding, and I always go, Eddie, be kind to your future self yeah. for tomorrow. If you do this now, yourself tomorrow is going to yeah. thank you. And that, yes, that's absolutely what I use. Is it in it and. If I'm taking off, you know, kit and clothes, even on the trail, I always put it away properly into its waterproof mm. bag, back in its waterproof I line. Really so. I'm like, fold it the right way. You're Walk going to be so away, grateful. And it up, and it's just those few seconds. And sometimes you're in a rush and you think, oh, I haven't really got time to do that. It's like, no, be kind to your future self. And you're That's always, gritty. it then starts raining. You then don't have to take your pack off and make sure everything's waterproof again. So, so those are the sort of the principles of everything in its place and everything in its place. Um, and bodies. kind to your future self and concurrent activity, probably. I didn't even know what concurrent meant, and now I do. But um... <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. I, you know, just to raise it like that, even if it's food and you're feeling a bit sorry for yourself or maybe taking a salt tablet, just think of yourself two hours down the road. I think that's a wonderful tip. Uh, last question from Becca Canu. Canu, I'm not sorry, I'm not sure how you say that your surname right. Um, I'm inspired, so am I, Becca, by Lizzie's achievements. Just completing the Northern Traverse would be an achievement, but winning, incredible. <laughs> Being a woman of similar age, I notice more niggles and injuries imp- impeding my training, and it takes much longer to recover. How do you maintain your training while avoiding injuries? Do you find the niggles are setting in now after such an active? life lizzie are you creaking when you get out of bed or are you jumping out straight um, down the stairs no, i was listening to kim podcast the other day no I d- i'm not creaking You're not creaking oh man um, i thought I'm, we're best friends always, you can't i always be. think i am going to and i get up in the morning imagining i'm going to be really stiff but then i, I often walk and I, I, actually um, i'm fine but no certainly injuries another area i'm really learning and and trying to learn from experts and people that know what they're talking about so listening to physios a bit better and listening to the <laughs> instructors and listening to people who've been doing this for longer and about applying what you've learned from one of those experiences about strength for example I now know for me most of my niggles are not skeletal they're muscular or tendon and it's all about strength for me um and therefore it's then focusing in what bit of strength do i need to start doing more of to remedy whatever the niggle or the injury is so going into northern traverse i've, I've had a um uh, an abdominal core injury so it's like a strain in some of my really low tummy muscles really weird weird injury but i know that would be strength it's because i haven't got the core strength somewhere and keeping all of the supporting bits to my core strong. So just doing loads of stuff on adductors and um, glutes, uh, um, uh, all of those sorts of Mm. activities. I know it's the strength that's key to it. So if you get a niggle, just starting to do the strength work to build up all around wherever the niggle is, somehow it will stabilize everything, which hopefully will make the niggle go away. So that's sort of what I I work to and and just try and learn from the advice I've had. Because if you really stop and think and look at your body and think about how it's all connected, for me, it all comes back to the same parts of my body that tend to be a little bit weaker. Mm, mm. So I know it's just go back to the basics of those particular areas where I need to do some strength work. Uh, stretching. I love I love stretching. I'm quite a stretchy, bendy person anyway. Um, so I have to um, have to stretch quite hard to really get into the bits where things are tight. Oh, my God, Lizzie. A hard no, stretch. Yes, I jump out of bed. I'm so bendy. <laughs> I, I was listening to that, which is um, again Kim was saying about being too bendy, and I was like, yeah, I'm probably I'm a bit. Do you think so? Bendy. Oh, 
Oh, because when I'm out running on the track this morning, my lace came undone. My hamstrings are so tight that I have to lift my foot up onto a log to do my lace up. And I was like, Eddie, you've got to get, you've got to do a bit of a stretch when you get that later. I tried to stretch my quads yesterday and I couldn't get my hand on my ankle. I was so stiff, it was terrible. But I love it. After Kim said it, you know, I've been um, stretching yeah. my back and I thought, wow, yeah. this is really, really nice. I love it. The other Good thing that Kim said that I've taken on board as well is that I've stopped documenting my yoga and just do it as what feels good rather than like, okay, I need to do half an hour a day. And I've also stopped doing the harder ones and actually gone for the more stretchy movement ones. Whereas before I was like, if this, if I don't feel the burn, then it's not worth my time. So I've been trying to be more mindful on the like, actually just mobility. What was the prize for winning the Silver Northern Traverse? Do you get an entry into another one of their races? No, you. Um, I got this really lovely wooden trophy, which was really special actually because it's you know properly carved and that sort of stuff. So it's a bit of attention. And then the sponsors. I'm just going to lift up my laptop because it's, it's popping up my laptop at the moment. But the sponsors, <laughs> Silver, um, uh, we were presented with these amazing head torches, um, a 2,000 lumen torch. But oh was, my goodness! Might be my bike rather, rather than for running. <laughs> um, so yeah, so those are the prizes. Um, and I've also I volunteered to help out with the Dragons Back uh, this year. So uh, for me, Ooh. it's about being part of the family again and getting to know another not spine family this time. But this is the Aurea events. <gasps> Gary, family, you're so. going to get Lizzie Loving yeah. at the Dragons Back. You, you are <laughs> yeah, you are the absolutely. luckiest man alive. <laughs> When you say that, don't be judgy though, because I sometimes don't have a place for everything <laughs> and I might be, don't think about it. I would never judge, I would never judge. <laughs> I make plenty of mistakes, so. It's going to come up. Gary, your future self will not thank you for the I way know. you left that sleeping bag. <laughs> sort it out. Oh, wow. End of every show, we do our quick five questions. But I keep saying quick five. We've actually got seven here, but we'll see how yeah. we want. Well, that's because you. I, I am in charge of the quick five, Lizzie. And then he is such a control freak. He's like, I've got two that are better. So I'm just going <laughs> to And then he shakes his head. You know, Lizzie, you work with all these sort of men that are like, yeah. I can do it better. Just let him have his way. He'll feel better. I know. So I just let him have his way. It's his favourite part. That's the best. <laughs> it's his favourite part. Okay, right. Um, oh, there's been a raid in the army ration store, but there's only one ration left. What would be your ration of choice, your favourite ration, if you could only choose one? Um, I don't actually know what's in the ration packs these days because they do actually change every now and again. But I love the sort of the curries and the spicy um, mm. chili con carne and rice type ones. So as many carbs and spicy is what I'd go for. Okay. Or rice pudding. There's the pudding. The rice, rice pudding. Do they still do the chocolate square that we used to raid my dad's rations? Yeah, the they do exist. But I, the only one I ever eat is rice pudding. I don't ever eat any of the other puddings because they're quite. Well, the boiled sweets. We used to get a tin of boiled sweets yeah. and they take the roof off your mouth. My dad, when we used to go on our family holiday for the two weeks in the summer we used to hire an army yacht at keel mm -hmm. and he used to take boxes of army rations and that's what we ate for two weeks he was so tight dad if you're listening to this they weren't good i still have nightmares about those tins <laughs> and it's just printed on the top of the tin it'd be goulash be like, oh no it's <laughs> any consolation we had tins in my house when i was little of the, the stewed fruit mum always used to make sponge pudding with the fruit oh, from my the army ration back tins. <laughs> stewed fruit <laughs> <just> <laughs> <laughs> on my phone, I've got a lovely uh, picture of my family. That's my screensaver on my smartphone. Yeah, what have you got? What's the story behind your screensaver? I've got a silhouette of one of my dogs uh, on the Langdales. The other dog is in it because she's black against what's quite dark rock. You, only I know she's there. Um, but yeah, it's a beautiful silhouette of one of the Labradors on the top oh, of the Langdales. Um, lovely. So. What is something you can do better than anyone else? Oh, I don't think I can do anything better than anyone else. Um, what am I good Very at? Competitive question. Fast. I wonder who added really this fast. question. <laughs> I reckon Leon and I should have a, a walk off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The fastest walker. Yeah, as I was saying it, but you were thinking, yeah, I can walk faster than him. Eddie, you would have to go <laughs> really fast to keep up with me. <laughs> would you rather live in Alaska or Arizona? Alaska, I think it would have to be because I think it would just be stunningly beautiful and unique. I think the heat of Arizona would, would get to me a bit. Yeah, it would I, I, I answered I'd have a summer and a winter house, basically. <laughs> just 
spend my time between the two, like Cornwall and London. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> now, we know you love a uh, black lab, but if you were a dog, what breed would you be? I like Labrador. <laughs> 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 so I like to curl up by the fire. I like cuddles. Um, I love to be outside. I love to swim. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. Snacks, like always, in the, always in the market for some snacks. Yep, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Always got your nose in inappropriate places. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't tell everyone that. Sorry. <laughs> and did you actually, uh, Silver Northern Traverse, did you carry a pebble from I did, yes. West to East? Yes, I found a pebble that was um, not massive, but it wasn't tiny either. Um, and uh, I carried it for my dad. So, yeah, so I threw it. On the other side, um, to so Dad's done journey. Oh. oh, he'd be so proud of you. Oh. And every week, we will share this, the podcast on Instagram, and you get the choice of your Instagram story. And he's got the pen and paper ready. I know, and I'm, but I'm writing it. <laughs> normally, I just write it on a scrap. I'm actually writing it Friday in my diary now because I lose it every week. Yeah, what song? What song could we use? Uh, so I've got a really eclectic selection of music that I carry on every race, and then I never ever be bothered with the fact of putting my headphones on, even though I love music. But I did think about this one because I knew I'd sit there and go, "Oh, I love loads of music. <laughs> I can't remember any of it at all." I think I think I would be Imagine Dragons uh, on top of the world would be my oh! choice. I love it. But it's a really, it, it really lifts me if I'm feeling that I need a bit of a boost and I love the words of being on top of the world. That is one of my favorite, one of my, one of my children's favorite songs. So we have that on Spotify many times, which I don't complain about. It's better than football's coming home or it's raining tacos. <laughs> <laughs> it's raining tacos. <laughs> oh, Lizzie, what a treat, thank Lizzie. you so much. Oh, what a treat. We could talk to you all day. Um, I'm so glad. Well, we got to see each other on Zoom, but hopefully, well, you're going to see Gary. I'd be a bit jealous of that. Yes. She's my best friend, Gary. All right. She won't be stroking your feet in a warm bucket of water for sure. <laughs> um, but what a treat. And yeah, good luck with a little bit of recovery. And then, so is it Dragon's Back for you? Is that next on your hit list? Maybe next year. That's what I'm thinking about. So hence the opportunity to go and see it and take some time. I'm, I'm, conscious because it's a pretty tough route that I if I do it I want to be really ready to do it and do it justice um but probably next year that's my my outline plan yeah best of luck I'm looking well forward you can to grill you, Gary oh, on all the deets when he's <laughs> yeah. when he's stuck on crib gawk <laughs> oh no <laughs> I do really I need you know if anything I need to go down there and do a record yeah but like all these race. bits you worry about the bits of the race that then actually when you actually do it and you're in the race you probably will just be fine and it will be other bits that are a lot harder yeah Lizzie have a great day thank you so much for coming on the podcast uh, keep us posted on your next adventures and hopefully see you soon yeah I look forward to seeing you both soon and thank you very much it's been lovely speaking to you today thank you take care take care bye Oh, I enjoyed that. Thanks for coming on, Lizzie. And yeah, definitely. We've all had our emergency alerts on our phone this week in the in the UK. Yes, so, yeah. I was with my mates because I didn't get that because I have a French phone, but it's quite it was quite scary, wasn't it? Yeah. Who'd you call? I would call Lizzie straight away. <laughs> like her in my corner. There's a few What's people the plan, I've met... Lizzie? And can you look <laughs> yeah. after me? <laughs> There's a few people I've met over the years and I've always thought. Yeah, if it's like zombie yes, apocalypse. Your, yes, your security team with your ice axe, who would yeah. be in that team? <laughs> and I would definitely, yeah, I'm, a, I'm not sure I'd have you, Gary, to be honest, because mm, I just think you thanks. might like, you might ditch me for a better offer. <laughs> Oh, no. It's like, well, it's like all these races. You'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'm in. And then you'd be like, but that team over there, they're like, uh, they got really kit. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I am the um, firm friend. Me We're and Robert were like glued at the hip when I was looking pictures out. <laughs> oh, I love that friendship. <laughs> We've got some juicy tales from the trails. We're going to try and keep it clean. Um, I've tried to l steer Gary off the clean path with my jugs and lugs. And, uh, I like still... the smut. Bring it in. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, it's too much. And I, as all my friends reminded me at the weekend, Eddie, you always get the idea and then you take it too far. You've gone too far and just rein it back. Know the boundaries, Eddie. So I just get carried away. Talking about winners, our Strava Club had some heavy mileage and climbing this week. Uh, I was nowhere to be seen. Gary, you could have been somewhere to be seen, but I'm afraid everybody peed all over your bonfire here. What have we got? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, Rafa. I don't know what Rafa's real name is, but that's his Strava name. 187 miles. It's just absolutely bonkers. Um, Again, it might be an event or something like that. I've not dug deep or look behind the curtain for Rafa to see what he's been up to. But yeah, Hannah Basley, she came in top of the charts for total time of exercise at 76 hours and 30 minutes. And she did uh, the Pennine Bridalway 270k Ultra Challenge. Hannah been a guest on the show a couple of times and Eddie coached Lakeland 50, was it or Lakeland 100? Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, a few years ago now, wasn't it? She crushed the cuisine on this um, race. We shared, <laughs> saw loads of pictures over on Facebook. Over. <laughs> Lots of fry ups and other food. Yeah, it looks amazing. That is how you do it. That <laughs> is how you do it. If I was gonna, uh, and we often talk about this with like these big events that you either race them or you treat them like an adventure. And that definitely looked like a culinary adventure, at least. <laughs> and then John Haney, friend of mine, and I've said it quite a few times, thank goodness John Haney was there on leg one of Ali Bailey's Bob Graham round, because without John, Ali might not have had such a stonk and fast run, <laughs> because myself and uh, Rob Brooks didn't <laughs> didn't cut the mustard that day. But yeah, John Haney, Paddy Buckley round, and that is just under 30,000 feet of elevation. So, wow, really good to get a bit of detail on what people people were doing there so i love that well done everybody we got some long tales from the trails i'm just going to take a sip of my tea sip of my tea to moisten my lips before this no one likes dry lips <laughs> <laughs> nobody that's the sound bite nobody likes dry lips <laughs> I can't swallow. i'm gonna die <laughs> Oh, I've been away. Sometimes as well, when you've been away from kids and you've been with your mates and you relive your sort of 20-year-old and then you come back and you're like, I can't. Oh, I've got to be sensible again around the children and be a parent. Uh, Right. Hi, guys. Thanks for the great podcast. Here's my Tales from the Trails happening many years ago when no one had even heard of Qatar and trail running was still in its infancy. I suspect Mohammed's camp might have moved to a more luxurious surroundings nowadays. No runners' names are included as while none of the runners at that day are still living in Qatar, they might want to return one day and, well, a visit to Mohammed's camp probably isn't something to broadcast. Oh, my gosh, I love this already. (laughs) I haven't read... I started reading this and I I like it to be a live reaction, so I haven't read this. Over the winter months, groups of us runners would head out into the desert on a Friday morning for a reviving runaway from the humidity of Doha. We weren't the only ones, as local families would have semi-permanent and very posh, we're talking running water here, camps set up for their use over the cooler months. For barbecuing, dune bashing, sitting around campfires as the old folks recalled the days of camel herding and pearl fishing sort of gig. During the summer, though, the desert is a desert. It's desolate. No one ventures there. Being adventurous sorts, we decided September was winter, gathered a posse and drove out into the desert. The main proviso to all bring plenty of water. Gosh, that's a bit scary, isn't it? Meeting at the designated parting point, the weather felt cool, air still, and there were about 30 runners. Gosh, a reminder about the water and we headed out. A couple of hours in, oh gosh, where's where's this going, Gary? A couple of hours in, the sun was beating down. We were baking and parched. Many folks had underestimated how much fluid they would need. This was the time before running vests were common and most people had handhelds. Oh yeah, those shop belts, I used to have one of those. You know the ones that the bottles always used to pop out from and be lost and, and they used to leak. Those who had water shared and it was quickly became apparent that things were going wrong pretty fast. And being September and quite obviously still summer, there were no tents set up and no one to ask water from. One of the guys suddenly piped up, you know, there's a camp which is always here. What? Where? Everyone replied. Well, I'm not sure of the exact location, but I've heard Mohammed's camp is behind that Jebel over there. We will get water there. Mohammed's camp? Which Mohammed? Why is his camp? And now, dragging our weary feet and cracked lips towards the Jebel, am I saying that right? I hope so. The guy pointed to one of the female runners with the one with the most gorgeous long legs and said, you must go into the camp first. We will all be right behind you. 
things were getting more cryptic. All right, she shrugged, just wanting water and too fed up to ask questions. A few seconds later, the rest of us women were sent into the camp, just in time to hear a male voice say, you want water? Look, I have wine and beer. <laughs> Uh, no, thank you. Just water, please. And for my friends, too, please, she said, as we rounded the Jebel. Mohammed, as it turned out, we were addressing directly, still couldn't understand why we only wanted water. Qatar is a famously dry state, but was happy to share, if a little confused, as to why a gaggle of Western women in running clothes had shown up in his camp. For it turned out, Mohammed's camp was a brothel. Oh, wow. <laughs> All of us were most grateful to him for uploading, upholding the unwritten code of the desert by offering water to those who have none. Suitably revived, we went on our way and were soon back at our start point with several valuable lessons learnt on desert running. Over our time in Qatar, we learned to appreciate the deserts, the challenges. We had several other near misses over the years. It's beauty, but above all, the great people we got to share the experience with. A bit like tea and trails. Back in those days, when there were no races in the country, there was a strangely high density of ultra runners in Qatar. You aren't going to get it on a plane to go run at 10K. And so much shared knowledge. You couldn't go out on a Friday run without bumping into a Safa who'd completed 15 plus comrades, a Spartathlon finisher, a European who toned the line on the first UTMB. I guess we didn't realise how special it was. Do you want another one, Eddie, before we Oh my God, I could read these all day. I just love <laughs> the anecdotes and the stories. This is the last one we've got. So yeah, please send in some more Tales from the Trails. Otherwise more. you'll get Tales from the Hen Weekend and nobody wants Tales from <laughs> well, the Hen Weekend. But this is the best. I, I love Tales from the Trails. This is the best part of the show. <laughs> right, here we go. Dear Eddie and Gary, having completed my very first ultra on the weekend, I thought to myself, what a better way to celebrate than becoming a Patreon member. Oh, thank you very much. And she Share my adventure for your segment on Tales from the Trails. Oh, you don't have to be a patron to share Tales from the Trails. Good job. Good job. I'm glad you good did job. the double. Yeah. The event in question was the Ultra X 75K Spring Series held on the Serpentine Trail in Hazelmere along the South Downs Way. Are you familiar with that one then, Eddie? Uh, I know the race. I've not done the race, but obviously I know the South Downs way very well. Yes. And I know Ultra X as well. So yes, I know all the combinations, not done it myself. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I must right. have been the only runner on the start line with a running jacket, gloves, beanie, buff, mid layer and base layer. That's good old trail running kit. Fair to say I'd woken up feeling pretty cold after a night's camping in a very wet and cold conditions. Needless to say, these all came off at the first checkpoint as I was stuck carrying and then I was stuck carrying them from the re remainder of the race. The route was stunning and we had everything from knee high mud to boggy grassland. And I even saw a sheep give birth, give birth to a baby lamb. Oh my goodness. Mate. <laughs> a huge shout out to James from the podcast. I bought a tube of trench cream after hearing about it on the show. And having had soggy feet for the best part of eight hours, my feet felt and even looked fine by the finish. I had no intention of racing the event until I got to checkpoint three at around 35k into the race when the staff let me know that I was in seventh place. Oh, that's always fatal that when you get a little heads up where you <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. And then often in French races as well, they'll say deuxième fille or troisième fille, and then the next person will say quatrième fille, and you're like, no, no how has this changed yeah. <laughs> you? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I started thinking of a top 10 finish with 15k <gasps> to go. I climbed to fifth place before things started to go downhill. Oh my goodness. I got lost trying to find the fifth oh, checkpoint no. and only managed to get there by following other runners that I spotted at the checkpoint. My GPX was still saying that I was off course. And only then did I realize that I must have downloaded it dated version of the course map oh wow we've all done that oh so many times yeah <laughs> without the purple line guiding me on my watch i relied on following other runners to the finish line disappointing oh. end to the race but in no way marred what was an incredible first experience doing an ultra huge thanks to all the staff at ultra x for an amazing race day and I still managed a top 10 finish, limping across the line <laughs> in ninth place. Watch out, Eddie. I have a taste of competition and I'll be coming with my racing shoes for the wow. South Downs Way 100. Wow, ended that with a wow. smackdown. <laughs> Love the smackdown talk, Abs and Brighton. 
Big jugs, big lugs, ready for South Downs Way 100. Don't really need big lugs, so we'll just go big jugs, mini lugs. See you there. Awesome, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love it. I've done that. Oh, you download, or the route's not on your watch, and you get to start, and you're like, it's not, oh, my God, it's not yeah. uploaded. Or it has a, a like glitch in the GPS, so it keeps saying, of course, of course, of course, and you're like, I can't be, oh, it's so bloody watches so <laughs> stressful but an excellent learning an excellent learning experience amps and you'll yeah. always check now if you need a gpx for the watch that uh you'll always check you have the most up-to-date version and hopefully other people as well thanks for sharing top your 10. story top 10 oh, i've got some i better get out go and get for top a run 10 first soldier that is amazing yeah we had a bit of um course anxiety with the teenage of altitude because they changed the robertson checkpoint they'd moved it i think to get people off the what is typically the Bob Graham round trod coming off Robinson. So they'd moved it slightly. So yeah, all during the week, we went out on our thirsty Thursday and we all had our maps out and stressing over which way we were going to go, but yeah, we didn't need to worry about it. Luckily, it's quite stressful as well as when often the checkpoints are at the exact mileage that they say. And if you're working on that and then you're like, Oh my God, have I missed the, you feel like you go heading towards the brothel in the desert again when you're like, oh, I'm so dehydrated. Where's the checkpoint? Oh my God, it's not there. And then you go around the corner and you're like, Oh my God, thank God. Oh, thanks, everybody. And any more tales from the trails, email them in. Where can they send them to, Gary? Where can they oh, send them to? Good job you asked. Hello at Hello. tandtrails.com. Hello. I saw, what's his name? What's his name that sings hello? Lionel. Lionel Richie. Why do I want to say Lionel Blair? That's the guy that does like antiques. Uh, so. Lionel Richie was coming over to sing at the coronation. I know you're a big Royals fan, Gary. Yeah. Um, I was like, oh, I like Lionel Richie, but maybe we could have kept it like British. Katy Perry and Lionel Richie are heading up the concert. I'm like, what the hell? I wonder if you're like a British pop star. You're like, mm, I get a, I could have done that. I'm free. It's a bank holiday. See, I would have said Prince Charles could have been a Lionel Richie fan, but I'm not too sure. He's not Prince Charles anymore. He's King Charles. But Katy Perry, I'm not too sure if that's on his. Oh, shuffle. Camilla, she loves a bit of uh, <laughs> Katy. Raw. <laughs> we got big news. We got big, big news. What's the big Yeah, competition. We well, luckily, Big Bubble Hats came on board as a partner, but they've also offered two hats for two lucky listeners. Now, the details of the competition are, right, listen carefully. One, you've got to be a member of the Tea and Trails Facebook group, and either Eddie or myself will pop a post on the Facebook group. Uh, two, you need to tag a friend who you think deserves a big bobble hat and three share that post with your community too winners will be picked at random so yourself and the friend that you tagged could each win a big bobble hat we'll announce it on episode 22 so you need to listen to the show if you don't and you don't claim your prize apologies if this sounds really harsh. we're having the hats we're having that <laughs> No, we will just pick another <laughs> winner at random. <laughs> we'll pick another winner winner at random. And, We're going to uh, give you four weeks, aren't we, after yeah. episode 22 goes out. But if you're like, oh, I've entered the competition, which, because um, there's been, let's just say there's a backstory to this. And some people, I know this is hard to believe, but some people are a few episodes behind on the podcast. <laughs> And uh, sort it out, I say. Sort your admin <laughs> out and listen every week. And episode 22 is when we'll announce the winner and say, claim your prize. Ta think of your friend. Think of your friend that really deserves warm, yeah. cozy ears, maybe on the school run, maybe after the run. They don't have to be a runner. Could just be like dog walking just every day. They might be a bit chilly. They might need a little pick-me-up. So coming in the summer but i had my big bubble hat on at the weekend so oh, never especially when you've been on a run and then if you've got a drive home or to travel home afterwards yeah. even in summer that big hat do you remember i left my hat uh, did i leave it at middleton in the spine yeah, you did. and i was looking at that for ages and who's is that hat i didn't realize it was your hat <laughs> and it found its way i think it was lizzie I think it was Lizzie that gave it to me about another hundred miles on. Okay, I love but it. <laughs> I get quite, you get, you know, you have signature pieces you get quite attached to. And I am pretty attached to my hat. We've been, it's a bit stinky. Mummy, I do need a big bubble. Do hat. I need to go through the, uh, the dates again for the competition? So there's two hats up for grabs, one for you and a friend. Both of you have to be a member of the Tea and Trills Facebook group. Uh, yeah, tag a friend who you think deserves a big bobble hat and share the post with your community too. When it announced on episode 22.
Right, I think my bladder's going to hold out until we stop <gasps> recording. <laughs> There's definitely a bit of nudging down below that I need to attend to. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. We did so much chat at the start. Let's wrap this up. Yeah. What does next week hold for you, my dear friend? Oh, well, I st I've got a little bit of doms from Saturday's race. I was so... going to ask. I would have horrendous doms, definitely. I ran Sunday. Uh, just easy. Of course Actually, did. I didn't run some. Did. I did. We did. Um, what I like to do when I'm doing a big day on Saturday is do a must have been over two hours, but just the weight, the weighted hike with this with poles up and down some hills. So yeah, I wouldn't really say there was much running going on there. But as far as workouts are concerned, and I'm going to shuffle them because today should be a workout, and I'm just not ready for it yet. I think I'll do the workout Thursday. And we're not going to the lakes on Saturday, so I might do a workout on Saturday to juggle the week, move things around. But yeah, if I do do them, it should be a 25-minute threshold run, maybe because I'm staying local, maybe a park run. Maybe I'll go and do a 20-minute park oh, run. Or oh, you've not done that for a long time. No, no, no. Yeah, so do it for the we'll podcast. In your hoodie yeah. and your T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe I will. I don't know. I do like a little lion if I'm not getting up for the lakes. But then the other session is six times five minutes all at that threshold pace because you have these big days out in the in the lakes and there's limited amount of running i do think i need to introduce maybe a medium long run during the week just so i can maybe do 10 12 miles of constant running, running. yeah basically um yeah it's tricky because i'm not going to go to the lakes uh obviously the weekend but we are going to go bank holiday monday and neil and i are going to do our final all county tops recce nail all those lines. Um, yeah, but what I do have tomorrow night, which is should be quite interesting, Sedgefield Harriers have their Neptune relay event, which is quite a big event locally. Lots of clubs come and do their relays. And I'm the GoPro guy at the beginning who basically just in case there's any controversy with the results. But yeah, hopefully two workouts or maybe one workout in the second long run. We will see how it pans out. But again, you know, because, yes, a Saturday's Teenage with Altitude was a race. I need a bit more recovery than normal. But I've got to say, the more it goes on, the more I'm a fan of the uh, collagen. I've got zero pain in my knee. It's absolutely amazing. And I smashed it. I deliberately smashed it on Saturday, trying to go down these hills as fast as I could as a test, just to see how it would hold up, see how my quads would be. Because obviously with Dragon's Back Race in mind, especially after day one, I want to, I need to be able to run day two, two three, day four, and uh, you know, up to day six. So I deliberately put a bit more effort going down the hills and the knee is fine. So I can't That's complain amazing. about that. Yeah, fingers crossed. Have a good week. What about yourself? Oh, okay, I've got to do something. I've got to get, uh, I've got to get this old body fit again. This is a bit of a struggle street. The rusty bones. The rusty bones. So I've done, yes, I did 14 miles. Get back on it, Eddie. Nice and easy this morning, hill rep, six by five minutes. I tried to do all the steepest bits and technical bits of hills. I was like, I don't want to push really hard the speed because I still, my chest still feels a little bit tight. And also I just want to ease. I'm going to do some big volume weeks now leading up to South Downs Way. So I was like, I don't, I need to, in order to recover for that, I can't push these sessions to how I'd like to do them because I love pushing myself. But so I was like, just hold that heart rate at like 160. So I was, but I was like, I can use these hill sessions a bit more like a strength, like picking that, you know, really steep uphill. So I was running up this uphill mud and I just slipped and fell flat I went from like running uphill like uh, like Killian and I literally, my foot just went and I fell flat and it was snowing really heavily and my gloves and my hands just went down. I was so oh. like wet, and, ugh, miserable. Anyway, it didn't stop the rep, didn't stop my watch either. <laughs> I was like, that's 20 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love so it. I've done that today. I'm going to, we've got bank holiday Mondays in France for like the whole of May. So that means my kids are only at school three days a week oh, goodness. <laughs> goodness sake so that is going to make the next few weeks quite tricky i'll make it work gary focus six weeks of pure focus now i'm gonna do a long run on thursday roadish bit on the trail bit on the road yeah 20 ish miles all running mm. all at that heart rate which is not really easy it's not really hard it's just purposeful <laughs> um and <laughs> And then I will do my 10 by three minutes that is in the, that's in the bank to be deposited at the weekend. And then the rest will just be easy, easy, easy trail running, but watch it. This Strava is going to get. Top of the charts. Get, 
that job. Those top of the charts, those to me, that's one week wonders. I could, you know, I'm looking for a consistent six weeks. I hope I get now. on the charts of Dragon's Back Race. Surely. But I didn't get on the charts of the spine race. Yeah, That's because right. I lost half the uh <laughs> lost half the data. You wouldn't let me manual upload it onto Strava. Um, so I'm focused yet. Yeah, I was invited to a concert on Saturday night. I was like, I can't. No, there we go. Back ed, back to boring Eddie. I can't do I've got to I can't do late nights. Even not drinking and late nights, it affects it affects it. So I have another little focus block, South Downs Way Hundred, and then I'll let my hair down again. And uh, enjoy a nice summer on the trail. But I feel good. I, I mean, I feel tired, but that's mainly due to Prosecco. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> Another show done. Stay safe on the trails, everybody. Run wise, run well, and don't overdo it. Listen to your body. And make sure you refuel with lots of tea or whatever beverage takes your fancy. We won't judge. My name is Gary Twitz. And I'm Eddie Sutton. And that was episode 220 of the Team oh. and Trails podcast. <laughs> <laughs>